Hello, hello. How was your day, Deku? Doing good. Another morning out here for the Africa Regional Qualifiers for IESF Dakota, and we had a lot of excitement from day one. We kind of just went over and saw some of those highlights from all that intense action-packed matches, and now we're heading into day two and looking to further on with all that hype activity. Of course, the first day was the very exciting for me as it was my first day casting a major tournament, but it was very exciting seeing what the African team could really show us, like their gameplay and everything on the first hand. We both of us don't know anything about the region. We know about NA, we know about the EU, but not about Africa. That was interesting to learn about. But we know a little something now. Those teams definitely put on a great show. Obviously from day one, we already had one of the teams confirmed. It's gonna be that Egypt roster that did earn their spot. Uh, and today we'll be seeing who'll be able to secure it for the second spot, right? One of these last two teams to be able to get that trip out to ISF over to Romania. So it's going to be extremely exciting. We're going to get to learn a little bit more. Day one made me intrigued. Day two, I'm all the way locked in. Of course, of course, I can't wait for the games to start. That's right. And I, honestly, in between these teams, I know last time we didn't get to see uh, right heading in. We didn't know too much about the teams, maybe a little bit about Egypt. We knew some of the players from over there. Uh, familiar roster that was you know played out m3 and whatnot would occupy but again today we'll be kind of headed into this like we did day one a little under the radar these teams we aren't exactly sure of we have a little information right as far as at least like the meta uh, the play styles of some of these teams and how they kind of like to go throughout these matches but these players are still going to be uh unknown to us right so getting to see kind of them offer up their name to us and right now we're going to get to see the results right from the previous day we were here from day one we were just talking about and there it is that qualified team there's dakota egypt yeah we saw how great of a show morocco and algeria could put up against egypt but they just got wiped out easily either it was still a great entertainment for both of us and for the viewers as well i, I was very surprised that egypt went out with a clean sweep but that's maybe their lucky day, who knows? Maybe Team Morocco and Team Algeria woke up on the wrong side of the bed. Potentially, right? But all those teams putting on a great show. Honestly, and we were talking about that. Definitely hurt to see uh, these teams not get to make it, but we're moving on now to a little bit more here onto the show. And here it is. We're looking at the teams that'll be playing today's Dakota and Ghana, Ivory Coast, Nigeria, and Senegal will be the four teams we'll be seeing compete today. Of course, in the first day we saw three teams, now we're going to be seeing four teams competing, which is going to be way, way interesting in the finals, in my opinion. We're going to see every country go against each other, maybe. We're going to see some interesting games, maybe even some drama, maybe even some very, very late games. And right now we're just waiting to get that Western and Southern qualification from the players. We saw that in the first day, Northern Africa qualified under Egypt, and now we're waiting to see what the other two qualified countries will be. That's right, and like you said, today we got four teams, not just three, like we had day one from Northern Africa, but now we'll have four. So not only is it gonna be a lot more intense matches, it means it's gonna be a lot more time to spend together on this desk, which is Dakota, to hype up these matches, offering up that amazing commentary for these beautiful matches. And now we'll be transferring over. We'll be looking at today's first series line up in between Ghana and Ivory Coast. And there those players are. And there's a standout name there with the Oculus Prime. Of course. And there's also going to be that God Beerus on the enemy team of Ivory Coast. Even Hulk the Smasher. Even Mikasa Ackerman. That's, that's very, very interesting. Maybe we're going to see some funny plays. Straight up with Hulk. And so something interesting here, too. I, uh, I know after I got done with day one, I had a lot of viewers asking me about, uh, you know, the region and these teams and the coaches. Because, again, not just us, but a lot of people a little unknown about this little slice of MLBB action. They wanted to know about the players and coaches. And right now you saw that from Ivory Coast, they have a coach present. So maybe today we'll see some interesting drafting, maybe some uh, adjustment for play styles. But so, Coda, I got word here. We're going to be heading right into our first series, our first match of the day, and here we are at the draft. Can't wait, can't wait. All right, now we're waiting for the first ban. It's taking a little while, but that's to be expected. And it's going to be an Estes ban. Wow, that is very, very interesting. I've personally never seen one so far uh, this season while I was playing on my own, but I've seen it in most tournaments. Hmm. 
So both of these teams have banded out these position fives, right? Diggy S is being locked out. So maybe both teams are very comfortable with utility uh, in that roam slot. Maybe have a little bit of insight on each other. Again, one of these teams do have a coach, so maybe some good scouting going on. Uh, it is interesting, though. None of the traditional first phase bands we're seeing right now, uh, unless maybe you were facing a team like Blacklist out in PH, but that's not the case here. But something a little more standard, uh, Valentina gets taken off the board here. Of course, but we can't assume that they may, maybe they were going to be as good as Blacklist with Atestes. Who knows? It's everything's possible. <laughs> But of course, that Valentina ban is a very, very strong ban, in my opinion. She can turn the game around super easily. She definitely can. And it might be a worthwhile ban. Again, if both of these teams like to lean into those support picks in Rome, that means Valentina would have a very nice time uh, right in the mid lane with that IMU to pick up some of those ultimates, some of those capabilities. So might be a good, I think that's a good, a strong, solid ban. Speaking of solid ban, though, our lot. Uh, even though he got nerfed right recently on that like balance patch that just got updated, uh, literally like what yesterday, two days ago. Yesterday, um, yeah. I'm not sure yeah. if it's in an yeah. I'm not sure if it's an effect here, but Arla did get adjusted, and one one also did get adjusted with her movement speed, which is interesting mm -hmm. that she's still getting banned. But I also saw there was a buff for Balmond, which is interesting. Maybe we're going to see some Balmond action right here. We could potentially see that. Uh, something I am looking to see, though. Ooh, so Melissa is still going to get banned out, and we, I think we're going to see a glue for joy exchange here, potentially. Or maybe not. Who knows? We're going to see maybe that Marty speak, which is very, very strong. Maybe they don't want to go for the glue. Faramus is still on the board, so, like, locking in the glue, it could get countered out, or they could just go for the joy, but then they give up Faramus and Glue potentially. So it's a it's a hard spot to be in right now for Blue side with this first pick. It's obviously the first pick is going to be the hardest. And we're going to oh. see an Atlas pick. An S5 wow. position in the first pick is very rare. And it's a bit interesting that we see that being picked picked as the first. I would expect the Marksman or Mage first, maybe, but not the Romer. I really don't agree with the Atlas pick so early. And look at that, a minnow, a great, great response uh, in the Rome slot. It has a larger AOE effect than Atlas and has that CC immunity to go ahead and use that Minoan Fury when those Fatal Links break out. So I definitely like it. Uh, this is definitely going to be a battle of sets. Diggy's off the board, so no one's going to be stopped. Um, but now you have to see what can they pick to kind of evade CC, right, to immune some of these things. And Mardis is going to be a nice one with those Mortal Coils, can get himself out of those Fatal Links. Of course, Joy and Glue is still on the table. Joy can be in the jungler position or in the XP lane position. Maybe that's going to help a bit with her CC immunity. But we're going to see a walking refrigerator pick, as I like to call him a refrigerator pick. And the floor right, does come out. So now the question is do they still. Does Glue even get touched in this game? Both teams still need an XP laner. But for Ram is sitting on the blue side. Glue's a little risky for red here. Of course, maybe they didn't notice the joy picks, which is interesting. We're seeing that Khalid action. I can't wait to see. And Khalid is he's a very interesting hero and he's very, very good to pair up with Flicker. He is. You know, something else I'm kind of wondering. Will we see the Claude get picked up from red side? As if a is here, Melissa's already been banned out. Normally a good pick into that. Claude is another really good pick, though, into the for but they're locking in the Khalid. A lot of first times here in this uh, day two for the Africa Regional Qualifiers, Dakota. Of course, of course. Everything is to be unexpected here right now. But I do agree with you. They need a very, very hard late game here, and even an early game. Maybe a Moscow would work or a Beatrix. We're going to see that Mincy targeting ban, which is a good ban. Maybe they're going for another dash hero, dash marksman, maybe. And they don't want that Mincy to be picked against them. I think I think Beatrix would be a nice pick for blue side. I'm not so sure about it on reds. I really think Claude is just a better option there to deal with this for Ramus pick. Beatrix can do good here. Carrie is also as well could do okay uh, in this line. There's a lot of beefy boys on the red side, so it's a, it's an option to lock in the carry. Carry, Claude, Beatrix are, are in that top those top three right now. I'm looking for hot picks in between these two teams. Even on Leslie would work well against the blue team. They're all tanking, and that is late game hurts very, very badly with that uh, critical damage. Yeah, I mean, that's a way to look at it, but also because you have the cold water, right? It's 
very strong in the team fights. Leslie's not the best in the 5v5 clashes. She's she's kind of like an assassin of the marksman, right? She wants to find someone squishy, find someone kind of out of position, come get a one tap, maybe two taps, get them off the board. Uh, but in a drawn out fight, especially against Colt Ultra, I think Leslie struggles extremely hard because you can't simply just burst out a target, right? Because they get to extend that life, extend a little bit more time uh, on the field with the Colt Ultra. So it may, it may not be the best option here up against the blue side. I really, I definitely think they need an AOE marksman. Uh, again, a Claude first option for me, Beatrix second. Anything after that, I feel is a little risky for them to lock in here up against this blue side composition. But I mean, we'll, we'll get to find out soon enough. The, the second half of the bands is almost out. Uh, we saw Eve, Minty, and Joy get taken out right now. So none of the marksmen are being focused right now as both teams need them. But there goes the Beatrix ban. Course, but st glue, glue is still on the table. Glue is very, very useful in team fights with Far uh, with Frederick especially. Even with Faramis, he can go in, he can find that tower. Frederick can go in and just slay anyone. But we're going to see a Clint getting shot, which is very interesting. Clint is brutal in the early game. Brutal in the early game. We'll have to see if he gets slotted, though. They're still hovering over it, still thinking, but there they go, they lock it in. So. Putting the Clint up up against this composition is very interesting. But there goes that carry pick that I felt like would be really strong for this blue side. So at least one of these make a little more sense to me with the Clint. We're going to have to see how that, that pans out for him. And we're going to see a Lapu. Interesting, interesting. The glue is still untouched. But glue also did get recently nerfed in the, the latest glue. patch note. Yes, yes, yes. He did receive a nerf. So maybe we're seeing the first wave of you know, that glue nerf being felt. Three of those XPs, the Arlot, Joy, and Glue, one of the hot adjustments in this recent balance update. Uh, so Lapu is going to be that XP locked in, and he's going to be matched up against Khalid. Never thought I'd see a Lapu versus Khalid matchup anytime soon, but here we are, Africa Regional Qualifiers, a day, day two, but a day of first nonetheless. Of course. I can't wait to see how the match outcome will uh, end. Khalid is strong early game, but the Lapu Lapu is also very, very strong early. I think what I'm really looking for, oh, wow, you know, this Khalid actually could punish out this Paramus. I was wondering maybe, I think the backline capability is a little bit stronger in Mori's hand on the Lapu, but I think Khalid actually has a pretty good shot here with the Raging Sandstorm. You throw it on top of the team grouped up for the Colt Ultra. I think it matches up perfectly as far as the size of the ultimate uh, go. So I, I think that actually can be extremely strong, but this Valir pick might be dangerous. It's not traditional for position four, but against this composition, with the Atlas, with the Ferramus, with Fredrin, he could actually look to punish these guys. Uh, but we'll have to see how the execution goes on as we're getting ready to head into that loading screen for our first match of day two, Zakoda. Can't wait, can't wait. But something interesting, I just noticed that Khalid is using Execute, not Flicker. Mm. Uh, it's going to be a bit harder to reach that backline, but still, maybe he can get a clean pickoff on Kari or maybe Faramis with that Execute, but. That's left to be seen. This is definitely very interesting. You know, something else that's kind of interesting here is both of these marksmen are going to have to be facing off uh, against some very large AOE set roams, right? And neither one have the Purify. They're bait baiting on the uh, the micro here with the flicker. So it's going to be it's going to be a little rough. It might be rough here. I mean, everything is left to be seen. Maybe they're going to be the best players we've ever seen in our lives. Everything is a possibility. It is a possibility, but one thing we do know for certain, both of these junglers are going to be starting out on their purple buff here. So potentially we could see maybe a litho, maybe if Eliminator looks to cross over. It looks like Oculus has given vision over to the orange. Uh, so maybe that could be a setup here for an early skirmish. Yeah, but also another interesting thing I've noticed Faram is using the support emblem, not the magic worship emblem. Yeah, it's you're going to pull be... yourself together. Of course, it's going to lose a bit of damage, but a bit of support on that uh, sprint work easily. And we saw, uh, I feel like maybe Eliminator wasted a bit of time. Like I said, it looked like they were going to contest for the lit, though, and they did group up shortly and then decide to just call it off before ever engaging but look at this and down on the bot side it looks like they're going for that Khalid but Khalid is very very slippery and he got out super easily using his first skill 
But right now, we still have three members of Team... Oh, let me see, to not be mistaken. Team Ivory Coast or Ghana? I don't want to be mis mis misspoken here. No need to fret over that. No mistakes to be made here on the desk, but again, down on the bot side, a little attention here is going on. Looks like they really want to try to set up one or the other XP for this turtle secure. You see they are trying to group up. Right now, the red side does have the number advantage down here. Maybe Blue's looking to trade it out and maybe just looking to focus up on this Clint up in that gold lane. But in the top you can that the Atlas tries to engage under that tower for that Clint, but the Clint gets out easily with that second skill, probably. <laughs> Again. But I, I think we're going to see an uncontested turtle here. The Rome and the mid, mid lane are going to be a bit late, and Martis gets that turtle uncontested almost. Yeah, he does. And again, you could see it though being set up. Blue side was going up there for uh, that gold lane and not able to find a kill, not able to find any profit. So they just come out on the back end of that as Red does lock in that first neutral objective, courtesy of Ackerman. So that's going to be a nice start for them in this match. Of course, but we can see a bit of pressure going towards the top lane for that clean. Maybe they're going to get the clean. You can see that the clean is in the bush. He doesn't expect that was to be there, but he gets stunned, gets outed by that was that fatal links, and maybe he's going to get eliminated. Oh, he gets out on one HP. He gets under attack. The Frederick dies at the hands of the Minoan Fury, and the Marcus is there to support. Paramis goes in with a cold tower, but gets punished instead. Atlas tried to do something, but it failed. It was a very, very bad trade for the side of, I would say, Ghana. If I'm not mistaken, I hope I'm not. A jungler for no one, it's going to be a bit wasteful, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, already lost that first neutral objective. Then you take the fight topside. You lose that as well. No trade at all. And you can see just right now a little under almost that 1k deficit. It, it's starting to get there right now red side is starting to take off a little bit you need to see if maybe Ghana can look to recover here uh, over a little bit of fumbling in this early stages of the game there's been some mistakes here but nothing that can be unturned you can see a retrofit going on the mid lane for that little under but the Marcus ends up getting it paramis pulls him backwards try to save oculus prime but oculus falls down at the hands of this nation and, and you know he had the fatal links but Getting chain CC there, and that's kind of what I was talking about, especially with the Valir uh, in Mardis there. It's extremely hard for him to pop that Fatal Links in time, getting stunned over and over and over again. And I feel like we might see that happen time and time again in this match, and it's going to have to be something Oculus Prime will have to overcome if he wants to lead this team to victory. Everything can be overcome, of course, but maybe if the Atlas had a Purified instead of a Flicker, he could have done something for that Minotaur, but both... Uh, Marpis and Minotaur have uh, C CC uh, control. Oh, CC control. CC D. I can't speak. Oh, wow, I'm sorry. But both of them can get CC immunity. But the Kinsta is almost every fight and they get out on 1 HP every time, which is very, very lucky. And speaking of lucky right now, they need to look for a bit of luck here. They have now fallen down into that 1k deficit, a little over a 1k deficit actually. So blue side is definitely feeling the pain uh, from what red is putting on. They're definitely having a clean game. They haven't suffered a single death yet through two two fights and a neutral objective. So very strong start for them in the opening five minutes of the match right now. That value punish is very uh, amazing as well. He can just zone everyone out from the objective as well with his ultimate. He can get a bit more vision. But you can see that the Atlas uses Fatal Links to get that Clint, but Clint uses Flickers, go back in the tower, that Paramis pulls him out, uses Cold Altar, but Clint still doesn't get Ooh. punished. No and... kill. Wow, Oculus Prime falls and us follows him as well. Again, coming up empty-handed, and then losing two kills to Ackerman on this Mardis, who's on a 3-0 hot streak right now, and he's playing a bit of the damage. He has that Hunter Strike, so that could potentially be adding into why he feels so devastating, but definitely not the snowball start you want to give up to a Martis. Maybe Martis is going to get punished there by that Frederick, but you can see Valerie just pushing him back away from the Martis. They can't do anything about that. Valerie's CC is very annoying, but there's also the Minotaur and the Khaled, which have great CC support. 
right? The, the CC is definitely the story to be talked about here. And that's what I'm saying. Oculus Prime is getting punished right now, having to deal with that. He even burnt out the flicker, so he won't even have it for this neutral objective. He just has the ultimate. It's going to be extremely hard to pull off, especially with the Minotaur. He can always look to just pop the Minoan and Fury on the rest of the back line when he goes in, but looks like we might see a clash here. Because the Minotaur is the Minoan Fury, but the Mikasa Ackerman gets the objective again, and against that, the Cult Archer goes off. And Mikasa Ackerman finally falls and another kill on Virus. Maybe Ooh. we're gonna get a third one on Yumi and we're going to get a Maniac here. Not a Maniac, a four-man kill on the Minotaur as well. And now we're waiting for the clean to fall, but clean goes for the eliminator, gets him. And Oculus gets another a kill under his belt. A bit wasteful, but a kill is a kill. There was a five-man wipeout. The gold days is did. almost gone. That's incredible. Yeah, he, he found two members there, three members there, finally getting a good engagement with the team being ready to follow up. And that's really how that fight turned up. They lost the turtle, but they were able to win the fight directly afterwards, which is a great trade, especially you lose the turtle, but you pick up three kills. I think they only gave up one death or four kills and gave up one death. That's a, that's a great trade, in my opinion. That's why that gold lead has minimized it's no more than 300 gold differential uh, in when it was around 1200, around that 1300, from that to now 300, that's a great way to recover from those early fumbles that we were talking about. And in that skirmish, they also got two towers down. Karib and Laf both destroyed the tower in the mid lane and bot lane. That's right. That so was a, a lot of pluses. Of course. Absolutely. I, maybe at that point, I don't even know if we can call it a trade. I feel like Red Side kind of got their lunch money stolen from them. At that point, Blue definitely took the clear advantage, but now look at this, a lot of numbers grouping up. Maybe they want to go for the siege. You got four members of red in the blue side. It's like at any moment something could break out. One rank stop for uh, Atlas and everything maybe will go down for the finally lead of Team Blue. Right, and Oculus does have Flicker right now, so he could look for a surprise engagement anytime they have pretty decent vision on the majority of the members on the map again all four are currently showing it's just clint that's missing so no surprises here and it looks like they're gonna make the call to start up the aggro on the lord pit but you can see marty's maybe waiting for that marty's using mortal coil so atlas can go with the fatal links and catch him on card but you can see lapu lapu engages and the khalid also engages for the junglers but the car in the back line melts and frederick gets up Steal on that floor and Virus falls. You can see that the Clint is doing a lot of heavy damage, but you can see that the Frederick, the walking fringe, is just holding them together. You know, Tower is forced to flicker away and they get over with a tooth and a lord. Very, that very was cool. really such a, a beautiful play there from Oculus. Not only was he able to find the two man set to put those kills into the hands of ASDF here on the carry, but it also allowed Eliminator to secure that lord without any contest. He was able to pick up the Martis in the middle of those mortal coils before he was able to pop the CC immunity and denied him the ability to find the retribution. So it went from a 50-50 to 100-0 to zero, uh, when you're talking about the retri battle there. And a turret in the top lane finally falls down. There's no one to contest to clear that wave, but it's uh, some turrets for a level one lord, which is a very good trade. But you can see that the March is opting for a damage build instead of a tanky build that we traditionally see in most pro plays. Yeah, that's right. Definitely going in for something a little unusual, especially since he does still have the Demon Slayer uh, talent. Still has the jungle emblem, but opting in for a lot of full damage. Normally, if they're going to go for the damage, you'll see him pull out the assassin emblem, the killing spree, but maybe a little different. I can't say it hasn't worked out for him, but you can see right now he's a little squishier and he's getting taken out quickly in these engagements of course second march is that mortal coil he's left to be captured he's a prey in the eyes of team blue i would have opted right. for a bit more tanker because khalid is also going for a bit of damage he only has that dominance ice to help him defend against the eliminator and mori jin right and he's looking to build another damage item right after the dom sauce he has two daggers right now so not looking to build another defensive item any. So it looks like though Ackerman's looking to make a change up. He does have two of the leather Jen uh, Jenkins here, so looking to change that up potentially, and he's definitely going to need it because, uh, like you said, Khalid not really opting in for the defensive build that you normally expect from your XP laner. 
it's going to make their engagements a little hard to pull off if you're not able to sustain these fights, especially up against Myth on Faramis. You already are kind of on the losing end as far as sustainability. You definitely need to do anything you can to close that gap. But look at Ghana currently camping bushes up against Ivory Coast. They're definitely looking for another surprise play courtesy of Oculus Prime here. Something interesting I just realized, I remember that Antique Curios just got recently buffed, so maybe it's a bit better against Mardis, and that's why he's opting for a bit more damage in this build. You can see that two members are going towards that uh, Antique uh -oh. Curios build, but you can see on the bottom, you can see that Virus is going to use his ultimate to get away. Will he escape from Eliminator, the walking fridge? Gets knocked up, the Faramis goes in to push him a bit backwards, to pull him backwards. You can see Eliminator goes for the all, doesn't get to execute Faramis. Tries to help him a bit, but he can. Minotaur goes to Minion Fury. Myth gets the kill on Oculus. Virus. And Oculus goes for that seat under the tower, catches one, but Valin uses his ultimate to purify away. And we can see not much going on, but Mikasa falling down from not being tanky enough to do anything. Had he had a bit more defense, maybe he could have survived a bit more. Maybe he could have pulled off another Immortal Coil, but that's just a bit asking for the unexpected. You know, what I think we're really seeing is a reason why you don't normally see this Valir in that position for a slot. It's done a okay job, especially earlier on, dealing with the frontal composition that Ghana does have. But where is the damage, right? A lot of the members from the side of Ivory Coast can provide CC. I mean, you already have the Minotaur, you have the Martis. Both of those picks can already kind of disrupt a lot of the engagements but you need some damage to follow up. Only person that's packing a punch right now is Vincio. And all he has is his three first core items. Still isn't a full build Clint, not exactly at his biggest danger mark. And you have a Valir throwing out tiny flames, fireballs, if you will. Not, not exactly offering up much, but look at Oculus. He gets a one man peek on the Minotaur. Minotaur goes for the Minion Fury. He gets a four man, five man stun actually. But Faram is forced to use the Cult Tartar to negate some of that damage that Team Ivory Coast is doing. You can see Beerus is going in defend that mid lane turret, gets a kill on Oculus Prime, he heals back, goes in with the Raging Sandstorm, gets a stun of the Lapu Lapu, Mart is going to use his full skill. And they're basically just playing now passively. They have a bit more map control against the Lapu Lapu, is going to try to zone out a bit in the bot lane, but. Not much they can do. We can see a bit of taunting coming from Mori Chin. Of course, and the mid lane bush as well. Those guys are really just recalling getting out of there, but Oculus Prime almost pulled off a great set. I mean, he was just centimeters off there from making a huge play up at that top side tower. Those are the type of plays you love to see from Atlas, especially at this level of gameplay. Pulling off something like a four man especially at those high ground towers is is just beautiful man it's a highlight it's an interesting interesting pick from them to be the first pick atlas is a bit weird worrying they can get a little bit more counter like the marches like the minotaur but it's still a decent pick because the clean doesn't have purify the body only has purify on his ultimate and the second march is that mortal coil he's done for All right, you know, something interesting to even think about right now, it just went back through my mind. Ivory Coast, right, with this unusual composition, uh, is the one currently packing the coach, right? They're the ones with the coach in their back pocket. And from what I can see is the play style they're looking for, the composition, it's so unorthodox. Uh, maybe a bit of an oddball there from the coaching. Maybe some things to fine tune, but I definitely can see they don't like to stick, or the coach himself doesn't like to stick to that traditional meta stuff, right? Likes to be very creative with the drafting, but with that being the case, when you pull off something as creative as this, the win conditions get a little messier. It's not as easy to pull off as something that Ghana has, right? They're looking for the engagements. They want to force the fights. Maybe a backline flank with Mori, with Oculus, and then you're able to sustain those fights with Myth, and you're just looking to keep the fight in one spot, let AS turn on those speedy light wheels and burst out targets one by one. From the other side, it's a but little uglier than that. Fight for the Lord goes on. Beerus tries to get a stun on Eliminator, maybe to get a Lord off. You can see AS if he gets a kill with that Kari, that speedy wheels, as you said. And you can see March is trying to run away. Can he get away though? You can see Minotaur is just slowing the now a bit. Minotaur is going to get pulled by Faramis backwards and he's going to get taunted by the bot in the refrigerator. <laughs> 
I would say the walking they... refrigerator here would be Atlas because of this passive that's freezing. I mean, you can have a, a couple fridges. I mean, there's double wide fridges. There's two. There's two doors to a fridge, or maybe you can call one the fridge and one the uh, the deep freezer. We'll call we'll call Atlas the deep freezer. He has the freeze, right? He's able to able to lock targets in with that fr that freeze pass. So we'll call him the deep fridge, and we'll call we'll call Eliminator the walking fridge. We still you can all everyone can be fridges here. Or I mean, Tower can be the meat in the fridge if you think about it. <laughs> As it's seen right now, spoiled meat right now. Yeah, they're losing a bit hard, but hey, maybe they can get the turn off from that clean. You can get the big punch in for that carry, and maybe they can do a turn around play, but that has to be seen. Against that in the I middle mean, lane, the tower falls, and in the top lane, the Lord takes the tower as well. Maybe they're going for an early ending? What do you think? They could look for it. Oculus has the ultimate, doesn't have flicker. Lord did just get taken down. It would maybe be a little unwise to force any more than this. They've already opened up the base. I would think that's good enough, and I'd probably just look to retreat here at this point. And it looks like they will. It's smart choice by the players. Smart choice, smart choice. But you can see that Beerus is just... He can't do much. He's super, super squishy. With all that second skill of his, he can't heal much. He's almost full damage. He has only one and almost two defense items. Maybe he's getting that Oracle to get a bit more healing in, but he can't do much against that carry, against that Lapu Lapu. Both of them have very, very great burst damage. Even without the damage, it's too much CC to be able to sit around a healing, right? You're able to channel the heal, but it still can be interrupted. And with Oculus there, with Myth on the Faramis, more, it's just, it's a lot of CC to try to pull that off mid-fight on top of the true damage that's being pumped out by AS on this carry. Uh -oh. Now we can see the Lapu Lapu engaging with the ultimate, the triple, she gets a kill on Seraphine, and we can see that the Beerus is engaging with that Raging Summer on that Khaled, gets a good ultimate stun on both the Jungler, the Roamer, and on the Marksman, but the Marksman gets out alive. Because Ackerman flamed the life, of the walking refrigerator over our boy Eliminator. We can see that Morijin gets out on his left leg. Both the fridges unplugged there. Nothing cool about that situation. They fall, they lose out there one to two. Trade going into the favor of Ivory Coast. And for the first moment in this match, it seems like they've came alive a bit. And this could be huge for them as Lord has spawned in and those death timers are still ticking slowly but surely from the side of Ghana. But the Faramis and the Karzai, maybe can, they can turn around Slurk in their favor because that the Valir is just Oh, Yumi. Up, and they get a kill on that Valir. Interesting, interesting. But we can see that the Khalid engages, gets the kill on Morijin. And we can see that the Faramis dies to hands of Vincenzo. An act of desperation there from Ghana. Not the wisest decision to go for the contestant, especially not in the manner that they did. A little too split up. You already are at a disadvantage for numbers. You need everyone kind of moving together, especially to play around Myth, who had the Colt Alter, and got isolated out by Ackerman there uh, on the Martis. So an act of des desperation might be exactly what the side of Ivory Coast needed to right the wrongs. They still need to clear up these lanes a little bit to push with this enhanced Illuminous Lord, but now they have a shot. Maybe not to end the game here, Zakoda, but they can definitely get to those high ground towers at minimum here. They're at equal numbers. Faramis got out after he used his uh, stacks. He got revived almost instantly, and they're still at equal numbers. But they have a Faramis. Faramis can help them win every team fight if it's played well, if it's placed well in a team fight. And you can see that the Khaled is going to try to help that lore, maybe uh, poke them out a bit to get them the way. You can see that Chenzo is also coming there to help them. In the mid lane, the top lane, the lanes are getting cleared by the Expiller and the Jungler. I really liked what Ghana did, right? They left that Lord down on the bot side in the neutral state, and then they went and cleared mid first, so they didn't have another wave to work with. And then after clearing that, then they directed their attention over to the Luminous Lord once there was no more threats, and they had Mori just to go go ahead and do some janitorial duties and clean up that top lane. That was a, I really liked the way they, they executed that defense. That was an enhanced Luminous Lord, and Ivory Coast didn't pick up a single tower off that Sakota. I mean, the defense of uh, Team Ghana was impeccable. But you can see that the Martis is finally getting that tanky build. He saw that Bloodlust tax right now. He's, he, he saw that he's not as tanky as he thought he was going to be. 
as the Kali is also getting his three defense item up. Almost all of the players are full item builds besides the enemy mage, the Valier. And the enemy, the, the Ghana Roamer, which is interesting. Both and not Ackerman. having full builds. Train. Speaking of those builds, Ackerman made the adjustment, right? He sold that Bloodless Axe to go ahead and fully commit to this defense, minus the Hunter Strike there. So obviously he's feeling what we've kind of been seeing. He's a little too squishy, especially in this late game. To contest those neutral objectives, you've got to be a little bit sturdier, uh, especially with this this team comp that they have with Khalid being a little squishy. Those two damage items kind of holding him back from max potential there. So it has to step up a little bit as far as durability. We'll have to see, though, if it'll pay off for them. That Lord will be spawning in in less than 30 seconds, but they're losing out on Wave Prio in two of the three lanes right now, except Bot. But something interesting I noticed again is that the Lapu Lapu doesn't have the Bloodlust Pack. It's one of his core items. That makes Spooling him a bit tank. less... He's a bit less tankier, though, with, without that uh, healing, without that lifesteal. Well, you have Bravery Blessing to work with, so you still have a lot of sustain with the shield, and then he's he has pretty much full defense items minus Hunter Strike, so he's having a safe game. He's only died one time, so whatever he's doing is paying off. Definitely wouldn't call him less than durable right now. First, of course, he's still a Lapu Lapu. We can get a defense in with his ultimate save. But again, that the Lapu Lapu, as we're talking about, we cursed him a bit. He missed that style on two of the members of Team Ivory Coast. And you can set the marksman of Team Lord Ivory Coast low. falls down. And you can set the Lord is actually almost retro, but, but Yumi, Yumi gets that lore still. Oh my god. And you can see that the car is going to get that cleanup after the mistake of the jungler eliminator of the walking refrigerator. Wasn't cool about that Lord still. And against that Eliminator is getting punished very hard. The Khalid is also getting a bit tanky. Clint is going there poking that carry out uh, insane, insane damage. But the waves are pushing towards the top. They're forced to recall to defend that. Maybe they're going to be there in time to defend that level 3 Luminous Lord. I mean, that's just a good contest, honestly. Even though Ackerman fell before that Lord was in range for a retribution, still didn't give up on the play. Yumi coming up huge on the Valir. A lot of his usability went out earlier on in the match, but still able to make an impact play. We'll have to see, though, will they be able to capitalize with this Lord? Last time, they found zero towers with it. Now we'll have to see if they'll be able to at least find one here, because that's really what's holding them back. They're at a disadvantage. They're under towers by six, nine to three in the favor here of Ghana. Ivory Coast needs to be able to make a play. You have to find these objectives if you want to win this game. Stalling out only works if the end goal is to win. But we guess that all members of both teams are going to be up by the time that Lord gets that inhibitor turret in the bot lane. The walking refrigerator is making his way in there by the deep cooler. is just tanking that Lord so Faramis and the Lapu Lapu can clear it. Against the car is trying to find a mid lane, but you can see there is a free push in the uh, top lane by Mikasa by that Marquis. Interesting that they left that tower undefended. Now Ivory Coast is filling it, able to find multiple towers here to even things up. They were able to pick up three off that Lord there, as opposed to the zero from last time. So now the map is starting to be a little more even. Still got to get rid of these high ground towers, but as far as outer turrets, both teams are without them right now. So map can go in anyone's favor. Just depends on who wants to look to make the call and make the rotations to keep Pryo and break those neutral states. Against that, the Lord is going to spawn about 50 seconds. That gives both times to prepare, but against that, uh, Team Red has a bit more map control. That's very, very difficult to deal with as the Lapu just used the uh, vision on the blue side of the jungler. And you're also getting right. that little wandering, giving a bit more vision, getting noticed when there's someone is trolling on the river. Yeah, that will help out a bit there. Speaking of things that will help out, both these junglers gearing up for potentially the battle of their lives as far as the context of this match that lord spawning in in about 20 seconds it's gonna be a 26 minute lord here long match for the opening game for day two here's a coda but this is what we signed up for this is esports for africa the iesf regional qualifiers and we now have a super enhanced lord on our hands you can see Beerus is just poking out Oculus Prime, just zoning him out, zoning everyone out from the team Ghana. And we can see that Clint is coming slowly behind, getting that bush checked. They're still 
uh, Morijin is in a very, very profitable spot with that ultimate, with that Lapu Lapu, he can go in tank, lots of damage, soak every skill they have. But he's getting poked out by the clean, that critical burst damage is painful to deal with. Because that the Khaled goes in the Raging Stars and gets a two-man stun. Morijin falls, but he has the immortality. You can see Kihara is getting that behind, they can't do much, but no one telling the team fight. But Lapu Lapu is about to fall at the hand of Nikasa. No. Never mind, never mind. I spoke kill of him and he got out alive. Stays alive and this is insane. So this is this is what we wanted to see. High intensity matches. Lord still being stalled out. And they're gonna look for the skirmish again. We can see another immortality is getting popped up on Foramis and we can see another raging storm so I'm Nikasa with that. Decimation gets a double uh -oh. kill. And maybe there's going to be a kid on that Lapu Lapu again from that uh, Martis, but no. Martis is recalling defend that base from those minions that were pushed in. We can see the walking refrigerator is dealing with a very, very hot oven boy right now. He's getting pushed away from that Lord, just denying them any vision towards it. And he's going to fall at the hands of Yumi. Right, and I mean, having to go back and defend, but getting a four man wipeout is going to be huge for them. Not going to be any members to contest. I mean, Myth is back on the board, but not going to be enough to get it done. And hang on here. Are they looking to... Are they going to look for the end here? Probably going to look for them. They're going to be uncles because the Kari is moving in the top lane towards the enemy base. Only March is one there to the end. But the March is one very, very right safe. Now. And in the bot lane, there's also fresh two members of Team Gana are recalling. But they got stopped by the Faramis. Which is trying to maybe end the game. No, they can't. They can't win anything. That that was intense, but not really. They tried to go for the split there. Carry pushing down to the bot side. For Ramis trying to hold it down against four members. Insurmountable odds there. Not really sure how they figured that would go, but I guess a 2v4 would have been much better. So they went for the Hail Mary play, but the prayer goes unanswered. And Ivory Coast able to win with the unorthodox composition the valir in the mid lane the freshly revamped minotaur on the roam clint gold lane hello africa giving us a great entertaining match for day two here's a code yes we saw how the builds changed drastically and the game changed drastically as well first we saw that a team ghana was using then they were winning then they were losing they were winning again and they were losing at the last bit they were luck, they had their lucky strike on and then they just lost it like a, 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 a casino in Las Vegas, as you could say. It was definitely a back and forth. It was a long match, but here we're going to go ahead and take a quick look at the leaderboards after game one, series one here. All right, we can set the scores are almost extremely the same, just two kills off. Both the Romers did incredible, incredible plays, but the Atlas was just not needed there. He, there was no one he could CC. The Valley had C, uh, CC immunity. Martis, Minotaur as well. The only two members he could go for were the Khalid and the Clint. And uh, right now we're just going to be seeing their replays. Against that, Vicenzo is on one HP on his last leg, but he gets a kill on that Eliminator. They can't do much. And you can see Oculus Prime falling at the hands of Mikasa and then as Falling at the hands of Mikasa. And a turtle, great, great retribution. And we can get the Faram is using his ultimate. And right here, they turn the game around. Team Gana turn the game around. They're just, just delaying them as much as they can. Getting as many kills as they possibly can. Clint is just playing for his life. But he's going to also get found out and killed. But he also takes Eliminator down with him. Right. It just kept on going, man. The action was just back and forth. It seemed like it never stopped, right? Just a brawl fest all throughout. So many team fights that we ended up seeing. 5v5s, 4v5s, all the way to the very end here. And I really feel like from the side of Ghana, it was just the fact, kind of like you said, Oculus having a hard time pulling off some magnificent sets. At times, it felt like he had the hot hand, but at others, it felt like Ivory Coast had all the answers to cool him down. But that last lower sale from Vari was the most intense part of the game. If he had not got another distribution in, maybe it wasn't going to be a turning point for Team Ivory Coast. 
Right now we yeah, can just eliminate right here, missing at retribution, which is very sad to look at as Mikasa fell at the hands of us as the carry. But they had a chance to win a team fight, but they instead ran for their own instead of helping uh, Eliminator out. It's a very weird play because at the top lane and the bottom lane, both getting contested. Not much they can do in both two lanes. It was a Kai versus a March, and there was no minions pushing. That was a very, very intense game, but there was a bit of an outraft by Team Ghana and by Team uh, Ivory Coast as well. That Valley was really a, a pocket a trick as well, a hidden card up their sleeves. In the last part, we saw how dangerous he was with that CC immunity, with that push backwards. They can't do nothing about them. Right, I mean, <laughs> diamonds in Africa, right? So. Definitely found the hidden gem here, the Valir, a pocket pick that definitely paid off for them for a little bit during that match, especially during the mid stages where it felt like they weren't able to ramp up the damage quick enough when Ghana was forcing those team fights, still able to pivot around the late game. And as long as they could keep Oculus Prime under control, limit that huge initiation, it was going to secure them a fight, a victory. And we saw that on that last Lord fight, Oculus Prime got caught out there in between the Searing Torrents, in between the Mortal Coils, had no time to press that Fatal Links button, getting his immortality popped and ultimately falling as well throughout all that action. So the Valir, definitely a key cornerstone, cornerstone to that composition and maybe some great coaching coming over there from the side of Ivory Coast. The, maybe the shot colors are a bit better from the side of Ivory Coast. Of course, the coach was there, but still, the Valir pick was... Very weird, and the Atlas first pick also maybe brought them their downfall. Maybe if they went with the first pick on that glue or even that joy, as you said, maybe the game would have turned out differently. But that would be too not us to see. But maybe in the next game, we're going to see a bit of a revenge. Who knows? We could see, and like I said, both of those drafts were a little weird. But if you can't beat them, join them. And Ivory Coast definitely matched the expectations there from Ghana. Didn't get thrown off at all by that Atlas pick. The Diggy banned out from their side. I was talking about both teams should have a great opportunity with Diggy off the board. But again, like we said, that Valir pick was their own little pocket of sunshine, their own little miracle answer to the Atlas. And Ghana had none to slow them down on those re-engages. That's kind of how we saw that ended up. 1-0 though, right over to the favor of Ivory Coast now in these best of threes. They all, have to, all they have to do now is find one more match to close this series out. Or Ghana can look to right the wrongs, capitalize on their composition, maybe adjust a bit, maybe not go for the Atlas first pick and uh, shake back things and reset this series 1-1. We, we saw, even saw the, ba the badge notes that were just released before this second day of this qualification tournament. It, it maybe led a bit to change the meta, change the picks that they use. Of course, it's a world-class qualifier. They're going to go for the best picks, even the safe priority picks. So maybe we won't see a Balm, maybe we won't see a Glue again, but that's all left to be seen, no? It is. And I, I do feel like the patches did go live on here. Uh, still not completely confirmed, but based off the way the drafting went, I do think those did go into play. They did go into effect. Uh, so maybe some things could be changed. I would love to see the ball man. I've actually got to try him out a bit myself uh, since the balance uh, I actually spammed him a bit right <laughs> afterwards Get back to the feels of Ballman being in the meta and he's strong right now Everyone is feeling that lethal counter uh, a lot of picks that we haven't got to see especially from day one We, we never got to see the Bane pulled out. Uh, we didn't see the alpha get locked in um so definitely some things that could potentially be shown here in day two they're already pulling out some unconventional picks so i would i don't think it's a stretch of the imagination to believe we may get to see at least one of those picks get pulled out today if we can see a valir i think i think we can see uh things like bombing as well then we could see something even out of my time maybe even a leila <laughs> god forbid but still it's a great hero as of recently even so but as you said balmond i also spammed him a bit not going to lie he feels extremely tanky and he deals an extreme amount of damage. He's very destructive on the battlefield and with a little counter he can just claim any objective he wishes for. Absolutely, and so I really can't wait to see what goes underway. I'm also excited to see what Ivory Coast does. I mean, 
obviously i know they found the win i want this to go to a best of three hopefully i can still get a full three game series but still see some innovative drafting again that whole composition was so unique so different i'm not used to seeing that across any of the regions in any of the metas uh even if i had to compare it to day one here for africa that composition was completely unorthodox compared to what we've seen from teams like morocco uh algeria and egypt right none of these picks really came through that we saw from ivory coast man a minotaur a clint of valir all in one game on one side is completely insane and the khalid they had the khalid as well so just completely unconventional picks man so i'm excited to see what they'll do next i'm also excited maybe we're going to see some unholy picks as you could say maybe even a florin would be interesting to see just just destruct we saw in the philippines how all my venus plays florian with basically no drawback there's some interesting things even an angela because angela recently got bathed in the patch notes he did a little a uh, little boost of the shield on the heart guard uh for the bait the base stats right so definitely something we can see there's a lot of options here to get picked up and that that could be an option again both of these teams banned out of support in their first two bands we saw the estes ban and in response diggy immediately taken off the board so no telling we could see some more supports either get banned out or see them get picked up in between these two teams it would be interesting to see a support over our time but see a support do a bit more than a tank in an unconventional way. The healing from SS is just unbeatable in the early game if you don't have an ant kill. And of course, the Roman farms a bit slowly that gold and it will take a second before they get that uh, dominant ties even. Yeah, definitely could take a little bit of time there. I'm also interested to see how it maybe they'll adjust. Uh, 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 Cause because the, the Khalid and the Martis, right? Both opted in for a lot of damage early on in the game. Granted, though, I feel like it wasn't too much of a problem because they didn't keep the damage items, right? They used the damage items. It helped them take an early lead up against Ghana, let them win a lot of the fights early on. And then once it started struggling a little bit, once it fell off, they immediately corrected it. They started sailing the damage items and started building tank items. We saw Martis get rid of his Bloodlust Axe, right? Start opting in for more damage. I think he's opted in for the Thunder Belt. Uh, we saw Lapu even, right, went for one damage out of the Hunter Strike and then complete tanked out as far as their items. So both of these teams uh, are very well aware of needing durability in those later stages of the game and those long drawn out engagements that we saw. I'm wondering if we'll see that again. I'm wondering if we'll see Ivory Coast start out their match again, looking for the early snowball, building damage items on rolls. Normally, you like to see them a little uh, more sh uh, strong, right, as far as their items. Uh, or if maybe they'll change their itemization a bit and look to immediately start out tanky. But I, I like the I like the idea of starting out damage and then transitioning to a lot more tankier items as the game progresses. Of course, but as you said, Martis didn't sell only Bloodlust. He also sold Hunter Strike later in the game. And he also got Brute Force. It was a bit tanky, which is a bit unholy because he didn't have that first helmet or that Guardian helmet to help him a bit more AP, a bit more magic defense from that Guardian, uh, from that first helmet, my mistake. It was a bit of an unholy uh, build. Maybe even he mistook the builds and he used the wrong build at the start. Right now, we're probably... It looks like we'll be ended up going over to our second match here in between Ghana and Ivory Coast. Ghana is sitting over here on the red side. Ivory Coast over here on our blue side, Dakota, and we're going to be underway in the draft here. I can't wait. I can't wait. I don't know about you. Absolutely, I can't wait. I'm ready to see the bands. I mean, last time we saw Estes get banned out first here, and but this time starting out a little more traditional. Ferramus will get banned out. I like the band. Myth did have a respectable game on the Ferramus in the first match, so I think that's a very nice uh, band there from the side of uh, Ivory Coast here. And the one one band, which is interesting, as she recently got nerfed, as I recently stated. But she's still very good. And the Melissa, another markman, wow. falls down at the banning phase. These teams really love to ban out the Melissa. It's so strange because none of the other regions really ban out Melissa unless maybe you go for something like an Estes, you go for something like the Ferramus, something Melissa likes to uh, play into. But just to ban it out right away in the first phase is almost unheard of uh, across the regions. But Africa, a region like none other, continues to prioritize banning it out. But I can't say I'm completely against it. Last time we saw the Melissa 
fall through. The only time we saw the Melissa fall through, it did net a win uh, <laughs> for, I believe, what was it, Morocco. Uh, um, and I was able to pull off and find the win. Yes, Morocco did end up using that Melissa, but we're going to see a Ling ban. Wow. I haven't seen that ban in a long, long time. I don't know about you, Deku. I don't think we saw any of the uh, assassin bans too much uh, out here, especially in day one. I think maybe uh, the the Lance Lance got banned a few times. I don't yeah, believe Lance I saw a Ling get banned out. So definitely a, a a little bit of an adjustment. Definitely something new. Like I said, both these teams are a little different as far as their bans and then their picks and then the play style, a bit of the itemization. Uh, and I think that's what makes the match so exciting. I mean, last game was a extremely long game but i think we just missed the uh missed the band here i think there was just a no ban maybe they were thinking too hard and they forgot to ban <laughs> yeah the timer meta timer diff we weren't, <laughs> maybe weren't keeping up they're getting a bit more time to think about their draft they're thinking a bit ahead of time and they forgot to ban in the present they weren't sure whether they needed to ban the layla or the khalid there for the second match uh but now, with that being the case, though, I mean, I don't know. I mean, more picks are open, <laughs> right? So you'll be missing a band. Both teams will have a little more as far as things that are prio. I mean, just off the top of my head, Arlot's open. Joy's she open. Is Glue is open. Uh, Valentina, uh, the Farsa, the Eve. I mean, there's a lot of picks right now that could get locked in for both sides uh, for good responses. Fredrin, uh, Lance, you know, there's so much open right now to be picked up. Ballman. <laughs> <laughs> Everything even funny, is open. Even funny, but we see yeah, a fanny. Clint ban. Wow. Out of all bans, we see a Clint, which is interesting. We saw how brutal Clint was in that last game, but with a decent uh, enemy composition, I mean, team composition, a funny, that's an easy pickup for that Clint. I don't know. And speaking of uh, easy pickups, looking like it's a, a hard pick for Beerus here for the side of Ivory Coast. They're going to run this timer down, it looks like, to the last second. They're trying to think of what they're going to go for. And it's a auto um, Maybe they're having some uh, uh, technical problems? There is yeah, I, I, believe, I believe it must be difficulties. I mean, they, they missed the ban and then an auto-lock Zass. No one picked the Zass. It was an auto-lock. So I believe they, they must be having issues uh, in the lobby there. But we'll wait until we get some confirmation on that one. Uh, Red side does swing back though. They lock in the R lot, uh, so it looks like they're gonna continue drafting, maybe as if it's as if it's playing on. Uh, but we'll we'll see. We'll see as this as this proceeds. And maybe they're looking forward to get a joy pick or something. Everything that can be oh, a pick is open. Thorns they go for the lance. Should petals fall? Lance was still a very strong pick against. Basically, any composition with that CC immunity on the Thorn Rose, that Phantom Execution can get out of basically any engagement, claim objectives. But the draft is a bit weird. You know, I was thinking of a name to call Arla and Lance. And I remember Lance, Lance's full name. We call him Lance so much. The full name is Lancelot, right? So I feel like the Arlot is already kind of integrated in his name. So if you wanted to make a collab, I think you just you just keep calling Lance by his real name. Just call him Lancelot, and you've incorporated our lot in there. So that's that's the combination we're seeing, the Lancelot on the first two picks from Red Side. That's a beautiful combination. But over there from Ivory Coast, though, they're hovering over the Atlas. Ackerman, maybe not sure to what they're going to go for. It looks like we're getting another auto, and it's going to be the Fanny. Fanny, there's been a lot of auto picks. And you have said that maybe it's going to be a tank Arlot. Who knows? Tang Lancelot, Tang Carlot, yeah. Bit of play with words there. <laughs> I, I don't is in... know what's happening with the draft of Team Kana, I, I believe. But it's a bit weird. Maybe they're having internet problems or communication problems. I believe that is what's going on. But again, drafting still kind of slow and methodically as if they're playing it on. So won't rush into any assumptions just yet. Again, still waiting on confirmation. Uh, about those things, but red side gonna draft this slow, looking for the next pick, and they're gonna lock in the Kaja, something we haven't seen a lot of, right into the hands of Oculus Prime. I believe Mikasa is back into the game. Uh, she selected Retribution as her spell, but 
maybe there was some difficulty problem, maybe there was some technical issues, maybe they have to restart their internet, who knows, everything is possible. But the Kaja pick is brutal against the Fani, even Zask is a brutal pick. And right now, the right. second phase of the band is up, and we're going to see a Mincy targeting band. So they can't pick against that Arlot, against that Lancelot, and even that Kaja can get in three picks all day, every day. It is, and I like the ban, right, uh, to open up room for Lance and Arlot. I think if you want to continue helping them out, right, letting them play the game out freely, I think you want to look to ban out Franco or Kufra here. If you, if you want to keep banning out things for the roam slot to allow Mori, allow Eliminator to use their dash abilities, I think one of those two options are a good thing to ban. You already locked in the Kaja, so that's one suppression off the board. You ban Franco, and that's the last suppression in the game. That could be the, the better option. The they they, they ban out Atlas. Atlas. Interesting, interesting. We are. The draft thing is a bit weird, not going to lie. <laughs> are we going to see a car getting banned? As both teams are lacking a Martin, that's an interesting ban. It is an interesting ban there, uh, indeed. Again, both teams still playing this out slow. Both teams still needing a marksman. Three of them, no, four of them being taken off the board. So the pool is dwindling. Uh, for the side of, of Ghana here, they have some options. I think you could look for a Leslie paired up with the Kaja. You could also just go with the Beatrix uh, as another option, or even a Moskov. Even, even a some good here. Lord would work against uh, Zask and Hollis. There's, there's a lot of great picks that are open, but the bonds are a bit intimidating, I would say. Among the planes exists the Your equilibrium, team. which I was made for. Eve gets locked in, one of the proud mages we haven't seen too much. I was seeing that bad oh. chicks that you talked about, and a Minotaur. It looks like they lock both in, just like that. So that's going to finalize Ivory Coast draft uh, here and swinging it back over to Ghana. They're looking for the last pick, Nita Marksman. Beatrix has been taken off the board. You could look maybe for a Brody. Brody's not a horrible option here. Or they could even look for the Claude. Claude's not a horrible choice here. There's lots of Martins that are still open on the table. Just depends. I mean... Uh, oh wow! Wow, that's interesting. Did not see that one coming. Uh, I. It, this is a very interesting draft, and Banfe is probably most interesting out of all of the series so far. The Alice will still do good against that Arlot, and the Zask is a pretty good pick actually. He has almost CC immunity on his ultimate. He can get out of any sticky situation. Can teleport out and he's getting paired up with Inspire so he can melt that Lancelot and that Arlot down easier. This is going to be a very, very interesting game. I imagine so. I'd imagine we're getting the the Alice over there in the XP lane matched up against Arlot. We got Zaz playing up against Eve. That's going to be an interesting matchup. But this this Nathan in the hands of AS is going to be something to keep our eyes on. This is not a marksman pick that gets used at all really uh, on the competitive level or at the competitive scene i honestly i would even dare to say it's not used too often in the in public matches right for rank uh as far as top marksmen Welcome so to not Legends. something we normally see but game one we saw a lot of things that aren't normally picked up and gathered as well so continuing on with that narrative it will be interesting to see how it pays off especially in this composition i feel like nathan struggles when he doesn't have a lot of peel uh a lot to kind of back Back, uh, bank, back him up in these team fights, so but we'll see how it goes. There's a lot of front life for the team of Ivory Coast, if I'm not mistaken, but there's not that much for a team Ghana. There, there is just Kaja there and maybe Lancelot, but still, Lancelot is a bit squishy still in the early game. And against that, the uh, funny, Mikasa has a bit of internet problems. That's uh, not acceptable in this uh, international qualifier, basically. 
against that playing on anyways. She's just starting us easily against that. The Arrow is there, starting the spawning, getting two stacks on her. She's already very low. They forced to recall. Something looked upon in the, the jungling side. You, you should go for the uh, jungle creep still, but I don't think he can with his internet issues. We'll be playing on. It'll be interesting to see what we'll see our first breakout. We know Fanny likes to go for those early engagements. Interesting, though, has the FOB, right? The Festival of Blood doesn't have the high and dry at all, or even the killing spree. Looking for more sustain. So I'm wondering, will they look to even target out the gold lane? Up against ASDF, he doesn't have a lot of mobility. So they could potentially look to focus on the gold lane, give up that first neutral objective, the first turtle. It will be spawning in less than 20 seconds, so we'll see how it goes. We already see a lot of gold lane folks from the opposing side, but we have a pause here. So Kota early on in the match, right underneath that two minute mark. Underneath that two minute mark, but you can see the top lane, there's already a skirmish for that Beatrix. As you said, Nathan doesn't have that much mobility, but he's super dangerous early game with Inspire. He hurts badly, and especially against a Beatrix, which also has a bit of more zoning potential. But there's also that Fanny, which can just cut through that uh, 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 Nathan and just kill him in one shot. He's not as tanky as Beatrix is. That's right, and I, with this time, you, both of these teams will be able to kind of really plot out their their pathing, right? To really think about what they want to go for. These pauses, uh, whatever reasons they come through, does offer teams time to kind of figure out what they're going to go for, what they want to do, really hammer down on their win conditions, especially for the early game. What do we need to do to make it to our win cons? So a, a pause this early definitely allows a lot of breathing room, I'd say. You don't really have to get right in there and, and go fast pace, right? Don't have to rush straight into things. You can think about what's going on, really hammer down on the X's uh, and O's, the crossing the, the T's, dotting the I's, and get exactly to where you need to be. So I, I definitely think both of them need to use that opportunity to kind of figure it out. I thought that's an uh, insightful thought, but there's still that Zaspi, which is a bit and and godly and holy but i'm still excited to see what it can do he's paired up with transpire and they have a lot of magical damage the alice and zask really did a lot of magic in the late game even so but magic worship on alice instead of mystery shop is a bit of a weird choice that's right and i mean honestly yeah the zask is a little unconventional but again this is ivory coast that has it picked up the same team that ran the Clint, the Minotaur, Khalid, uh, all in one game, right? So anything can do it. And the Valir. So a Zaz pick, while it is a little unusual for most teams, I feel like if anyone can do it out here in the Africa Regional so far, it'd be it'd be these guys. I mean, there's a reason it was instantly locked. Maybe it shows that Zaz is probably one of his main mages, and that really shows a bit of everything that they can just pull off they play unconventional mages unconventional marksmen unconventional roams and unconventional explainers that just shows how much maybe they've trained maybe the meta they were i think that the meta was going to change overnight as even the last button maybe they were speaking a bit more fighter nerfs or a bit more fighter buffs anything can be possible in this land of dawn in this mobile legends community or anything is possible and whew, i tell you what if they were all fired up, might be lacking all the spark that they need. Pause has been going on for a bit of time, but again, game plan should be completely understood at this point. Maybe even the coach able to have a little more time with the players potentially from Ivory Coast to really batten down those hatches. I'm also wondering if this lets the side of uh, Ghana right really get their mental right. They're the ones currently down in the pit. One to zero facing elimination here. All the time they can use to catch their breath, really get back focus, mental clarity moment, and be able to get this series reset one to one because it's do or die for them right here. If they lose this here, they take the loss in the series. Still have time to recover though in the rest of the matches today. Of course, but still, they maybe this will maybe bring their downfall to lose the qualifiers. If they win this, they may be going to get a bit more chance, even if they get the. Uh, three one. Even if they get the two, three two, who knows? Everything is possible, but uh, everything can be just explained after our pause. We're going to see, but still, even after lagging, uh, Team Blue is still in the gold lead, as we can see. 
they've gotten a bit more gold. There's three players, as I said, in the top lane. Beatrix and Glastrop is heading there as well, but Zask and Minotaur were also on their way. That leaves the bot lane free, or funny maybe to gank even. That's right, definitely provides some availability. And I, I really would like to see Ackerman pull off ganks on this fanny, but again, with the emblem swap, maybe it makes it a little more difficult, right? Normally you take the high and dry when you want to gank the gold lane because you find the marksman by themselves, which is kind of the condition for high and dry. You get that additional boost of damage if the target is alone, but not having that will make executing that one-on-one -on -one kill a little bit harder. I wouldn't say extremely difficult. It is still a fanny after all, but it does. It is something interesting to note. It does take away a bit of the damage you're looking for in that early stage of the game, especially when you're talking about not having too many items. That extra boost from the high and dry pays off immensely for those early kills. But without it, using the Festival of Blood, the extra sustain from the spell vamp, uh, that you still you need to get kills to even proc that. So <laughs> it's like it's it's almost a a weird place to be in using the FOB. But we'll see how it'll pay off and if they will still use the ganks and if they do how successful they are with the change. But still, the Festival of Blood will make Fanny a bit more tankier. It being a fighter emblem will just give Fanny a bit more tankiness. Maybe she can tank a bit. One more tower shot could count a lot. But that's all left to be seen. Of course, as you said, she needs to get some kills to get that Festival of Blood up and running. Two or three kills so she can get a bit more lives. But everything can go their way. It's, it's still a Fanny, it's still a wild card. It is a wild card and wild times right here in Africa. We're still waiting to see. They're just taking a break, exactly. fix everything that's wrong. Even taking their time, you just better make sure to cut, uh, to measure twice than to cut once, as it goes on saying. Measure twice and cut once. I've not course. heard that one before. They're just <laughs> checking everything that's possible to that could go wrong. Maybe. They just doing double checks, triple checks, everything that will make sure that the game will go on smoothly and in their favor even. So we'll see what all what all is gonna how things will go out in both of these teams' favor indeed. I do like I have to say as far as compositions, while I do like the unconventional stuff, the weird things every coast, I think overall I'd really have to get over to the side of Ghana. I mean, the unlock, the lands, Aja, Eve, extremely strong, high in the meta, high in the win rate column as well. Only thing a little off about them is the, the Natan, but when you're being carried by four super picks in the meta, I think I think it's a little easier to pull that off. See, Nathan can push turret super easily using his ultimate. Just using that ultimate, pushing the, the tower. Just with Inspire as well, he can melt on the Nexus in like, Two, three shots even. But, I mean, it's an 8 and it's a wild pick as well. He can clear his buffs, he can clear his lord insanely fast. And with the changes that happened to him a season ago, if I am not mistaken, he just changed to magical build, so he'll be a bit more dangerous towards that bad chip. She won't uh, buy that Wind of Nature, and if she buys it, maybe it's going to be a mistake on her side. Nathan being able to deal a lot of magic damage in a span of like two, three seconds can just change the game instantly. Ask and Beatrix has, of course, everything is left to be seen. We can't say much from now. Maybe the top gank is going to be successful. Maybe there is going to be a gank in the XP lane for that Arlot. We're just waiting to see what will happen. But we're just waiting and waiting, hoping that the game will finally start soon i i can't wait and I'm, I'm interested to see how it will play out of course there's the troubles of the both teams going for a late game because they have a load of late game heroes but right now we're going to head into a short break and we're going to pick up right after the issues have been fixed and that's about it for now. See you guys after the break.
All right, so we are back to the game. There were some technical issues, but they are fixed now, and we are ready to see what happened in the game. You can see that almost everyone on the team, basically everyone, has gotten level 4 so far. And there is just a fight in the middle, and the Kasha gets out, and Minion uses the Minion of Fury, and... And the... And... And Fanny uses that uh, cut shot on the Kasha. And he does not get away. He was lucky once, but he didn't have a second life to waste. All right, but able to find the first blood. Still rocking the Festival of Blood, even with the changes. So definitely something they really wanted to commit to. So a little different for me, but when you're named Mikasa Ackerman and you're playing Fanny, can't really question it. It is a large name to live up to, but hopefully not having that name for no reason. First of all, I can't wait to see what Fanny will pull off. We get that Eliminator in the top lane trying to punish at Beatrix, but the Beatrix is kind of tanky in the early game. Even so, the fun is there in the top lane, gets that Nathan super low HP, and we can see Fanny claim the life of Nathan. And still around, there's nothing to be talked about. Uh, just, just regular game plan from now on, I believe. Beerus using that vision in the middle bush. Getting a bit more map control, but he used the ultimate, pokes down Oculus Prime, gets him to under half HP, and the Fanny goes to clean up afterwards after Beerus, getting another kill on the uh, Festival of Blood Mark. That's right, and now the first or second neutral objective here up for grabs in between both these teams, and it looks like all the control is going to go to Ivory Coast. It's like there's going to be much contest from Ghana, not going to be able to close the distance. Giving the easy to pick up as Mixa briefly flies in and locks it in. Uncontested objective, which is to be unexpected with the Kaja on the side of Ghana. But still, Dread. there is uh, the, the top lane, even so, if the Nathan got ganked, the top lane has still been pushed up. Uh, Goldchill still is out of there, and Nathan gets out of a nasty predicament that if he gets stunned by the Zas. He still gets dived on under the tower, uh -oh. and his life gets claimed by Bennett's Rage. The Lancelot is there, but he gets knocked up by the Minion Fury, and the Zat falls at the hands of Eliminator with the help of Eve. Still, the Minotaur is super low HP, and the Beatrix is still above half HP. There still can be a fight going on, even a Sniper can count, and against that, Morjin traded his life with the Alice. Right, a quick little trade, a little bit of a... One for one there, in between, at least in between those two, obviously. More going to the favor, though, of uh, Ivory here, but a very fast start. We already have eight kills on the board, and we're just underneath that six-minute mark. Those outer turrets in the side lanes on the side of Ghana are dangerously low, so it seems they're losing out on both sides of the map, and that's not really good when you're talking about keeping control and keeping that upbeat tempo and pressure on the map here. We can see that Izakaja is just giving vision to the jungle, the blue side. And we can see that the Beatrix is playing super cautiously. We can see that she has Bennett equipped, she can just poke the enemies. She will still do a lot of damage, but against Oculus, Oculus Prime is just getting poked up by the Zask and Fanny goes in to try to get a kill on the Nathan, but she failed. But we can see that the tower is getting pushed, it's a good trade for basically only two ultimates and a retribution. But the Lord at third, I mean, is going to be up. The neutral object is about to be spawning in 5 seconds, counting. And the mid lane there is still that priority fight. You can see that the Arlot and the Lancer are trailing that mid lane. You can see that the fan is going to try to cancel that objective fight. She's, her attribution is almost up. And you can see that the Alice is just pushing the tower. There is no one to contest her, and that's another free objective, probably for Team Ivory Coast. That's right. Uh, and but... Eliminator gets the retribution, which is incredible still it's a lancelot versus a fanny the lancelot will probably have the upper hand in the turtle fight top lane beatrix still alone feeling sad a bit clearing those waves still having one kill with the nathan's zero to two and the minotaur and the al is just <laughs> playing cautiously going running away from a tarot he, he's super scary in the early game even so he's equipped with the Festival of Blood Emblem, which will allow him to get a bit more healed up, the more kill he gets. You know, I'm really concerned and worried about the, uh, the song. Like you said, he's already 0 and 2. Not exactly already a conventional marksman to use. Not something that's, like, extremely strong right now in the meta at, at all, really. Up against Beatrix, something that is 
super reliable, consistent results. Might have been a bit of a gamble here, a lot of a risk, but look at this in the mid. Kaja going with the ultimate, catches one, but he gets out alive against that. The Nathan under tower gets almost laid out by Eve, joins him, and the Oculus Prime also dies at the hands of Mikasa, Ackerman, and Fierus. Against the Morigen, he's trying to get another punish under the tower. He's trying to auto sustain, but the Beatrix just deals too much damage. They can't do much to really do anything. They have a lot of life still. The Minotaur is also there, which can help them heal a lot. It does help them heal a bit, but will it be enough to be able to cover the wounds as Eliminate is able to narrowly escape with that Phantom Execution that we just saw? But they're falling behind here. They're down about 2k, a little under 2k gold. Mikasa's having a great game. I know I was kind of questioned about how this Fanny would work in the early stages without the high and dry, but obviously showing the expertise and living up to the name 4-0 and 2, having a flawless game and a bit of a snowball, right, for the side of Ivory Coast, even with this unorthodox composition yet again prevailing and showing us that not everything has to be stuck in the meta. It's the Minotaur goes in with the Minotaur, Minotaur Fury, gets a two-man stun. And you can see that Beerus claims the life of Oculus Prime and then maybe will lead to a free objective. And also Beerus claims the life of the native of Us. And Eliminator gets off on his last limb. He gets out on 1 HP. And that's probably a free objective for the uh, team of Ivory Coast. That's right. And now able to bring their attention, right, over to this Lord. Potentially, actually, before they do that, they're going to go ahead and make quick work of the purple buff. So Eliminator... Might be going without that. Looks like he's going to make it in time. The one who's going to be able to pull off with that. I don't think he was able to come get it. No, Yumi walks away with it. And that's a very huge advantage to Yumi because of the blood oath. The mana goes super high on Alice on the early to mid game, which leads her to having no mana for basically anything fast. And that blue buff scene maybe changed the outcome of the entire game. That's right, and, but they're gearing up for a siege down on the bot side here, Zakoda, so potentially a fight breaking out. Right, but you can see they are fighting, they got the tower, but you can see Nathan with his ultimate pushing everyone back. And Eve using that real room manipulation, getting that Minotaur locked in. Minotaur is forced to use Minotaur Rage, gets a stun, but doesn't have anyone to follow up. And you see Nathan is doing a lot of work, getting two kills in one fight. Virus slaying a Morigin at the end, which is unfortunate, but it's a two for one trade. That goes in the favor of Ganon right now, but you can see Beerus and Yumi staying in the middle and going to the top lane, clearing that wave, pushing the tower in. Maybe even so, going for that Lord afterwards. Maybe, potentially. You know, something interesting to point out. AS finally picking up two kills in this match. He's died four times as opposed to Vince, 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 uh, Vincejo, one death, but he's only 200 gold down here. But hang on, in the mid side, there's a fight. Beers uses that that uh, ultimate that uh, deception welcome, and you can see that he claims Mif's life. Even so, he can't escape because that's how brutal that uh, task is. Ooh, we can see a very nice ultimate coming in from uh, Mikasa, getting that eliminator, taking a last lot out of the game. Top lane getting crushed, and the bot lane getting crushed by the red side minions. But that leaves with a free objective in my eyes. Even so, blue down. We saw Oculus, right, use a Divine Judgment on Sabiris. They didn't have any CC at that point then for Mikasa looking for the cleanup, who was able to come find Eliminator, which is why now this Lord is going to be up for free grabs with no jungle on the board to come contest them. But it's very crazy right now how the way they're executing and, and managing this being able to outplay. And honestly, taking a, taking a look back while we have a moment, I... I saw it when that Divine Judgment went out on Beers. He was actually standing still in the mid lane. I was actually going to ask maybe if he was having issues, but I feel like maybe it was a bait because as soon as the Divine Judgment ended, he channeled out the ultimate, picked up the kill on Myth, and then here comes Mikasa for the cleanup. It almost seemed like it all went according to plan because nobody fell from the side of Ivory Coast off that engagement from Oculus Prime. That's right, but also there was something interesting I, I noticed. They didn't wait for that upgraded lore, for that luminous upgraded lore. Ooh. But you can see a good stun. Oh my god. Huge, huge stun coming from the Minotaur. The Benedict and the Fanny just going and freestyling, showing wow. who's the, 
best Titan Slayer right now. We can see a five man wipeout and there is a clean swipe from the team of Ivory Coast. That was an insane play from the Minotaur and the Funny. Even so, the Alice and the Beatrix made quick and easy work of the HP of the enemies. Really, there was nothing they could have done. That was just a very good play from the Minotaur. No connection, no problem, says Ivory Coast. They find the sweep with all the unconventional picks, the unconventional play style, and an amazing performance from them, honestly. I hate seeing sweeps, but I can't say that I'm unimpressed with this one because this was done a little unorthodox. This isn't your tried and true drafting, tried and true picks. They went completely off the board, all the way off the meta, and I actually just made their own meta here in the Africa Regional Qualifiers, and it paid off in a huge way. So starting off day two, the first series of Coda, we end that on a sweep, an early broomstick out here for the side of Ivory. Of course, we saw how dominant that Zask was on lane. Even with his ultimate, they could have done nothing to him. He was tanking a lot of damage, doing a lot of damage as well, and he was paired up with Inspire. Melting enemies was his job. Of course, Beatrix with that Bellad's Rage really helped that Minon Furious, that, that Minotaur out with that Flicker. So it was just a very good team composition, even so. The Alice had IOE, the Beatrix had IOE. Even so, the Fanny also had IOE. So it was a very good team composition, even with some technical difficulties. That's right, and uh, it was... We're gonna be heading over to look over at the scoreboards and Let's look at some replays right after that, Zakota. And here we go with those leaderboards looking at some of these statistics. Mikasa Ackerman lag, but not jet lagged. Bird in the sky, 8 0 and 8. A flawless game, an MVP for him. But honestly, Zakota, I feel like that MVP could have easily been swung over to the Minotaur after that last play. 1 1 15 KDA is a pretty nice stat line to get an MVP, but that five man set to close out the match. Honestly, could have easily been an MVP himself, and we'll definitely see that as these replays are going to start rolling out. Here's Dakota. I can't wait to see that Minotaur five man uh, ultimate again. It was super intense. You can see that here in the early lineup, trying to get in that cutthroat killer that Kaja it was super, super worth it. That gives him your stacks on that festival of blood. You can see that Minotaur getting three man star, four man star, but there is almost no follow up. He's getting dragon power. Chenzo can't do nothing to save him a lot, but Bennett's Rage comes in action, just zoning them out. If they get close, they know they're gonna get hurt, and in the bottom, there was also that 1v1 fight. But we can see that Mikasa pushed the turret, almost destroying it, and Seraph, you're getting a lot of good stuns in, just showing how strong Minotaur is after his recent buff. Right, and looking at this, man, they're fine the sieges. Looking for all the tower dives in the mid lane. They had so many coordinated attacks and they walked away without many. And look, this was the play I was talking about that I felt like the side of Ghana got baited out. Beer is staying still in the mid lane, got pulled by the Divine Judgment, pulling out the ultimate for the Uno reverse card. And then it's a bird, it's a plane. No, it's just Mikasa Ackerman doing his thing on the fan. He finally the kill on the Eliminator. But this right here was magical. This was the one. Look at this. Five man knock. Oh, no, four man. He actually oh, didn't catch oh, our lot. But. And the other minute, that's still a huge play. A large four-man set. What a beautiful way to end off the game. And an even better way to end off the series is they were able to clearly go ahead and end off in a nice, spectacular fashion for the first sweep. Hopefully was, the last sweep, though. That was a very good game. But right now, after this intense gameplay, we're going to head into a short break. And we're going to catch you guys later with the next much.
and we are back waiting for the second game of the night to finally start what do you think about deck what do you think about the game that just happened like 20 minutes before what was yeah, I mean, your perception on them the series before i mean again i was talking about coming into day two i was intrigued from day one i'm fully committed for day two and ivory coast already meeting the expectation that i had set out wanting to see some new things wanting to see a lot of excitement and what africa had to offer and ivory coast had a lot to bring out from their bag of tricks ultimately getting them a sweep and letting them uh start off good uh, still have a, a ways to go right four teams competing today as opposed to three so still gonna have to battle it out but they're off to a great start a sweep for your first series is a good way to kick off the day for the africa regional qualifiers of course, and the next game is going to be between Ivory Coast and Senegal. We saw what Ivory Coast could have... Uh, basically, what Ivory Coast is, and we're going to see what S Senegal can do against them. We saw how dangerous Ivory Coast is, even with their comfort picks. We saw with Zask, with Fani. They were a very, very dangerous team composition. But that's all left to see. Maybe Senegal can turn the games around in their favor. Hey, you know, I'm really curious. Uh, it is like, I wonder, because, you know, at least over here in North America, we have this thing where a lot of teams don't have coaches, right? Uh, a lot of management behind. We have one team, it's currently the one that's actually uh, heading out to a world event right now, which is Outplay, but a coach makes a world of difference. And I'm not sure if any of these other teams have one. Obviously, last match, Ghana didn't have a coach uh, on their roster. At least in Senegal doesn't have one as as well, so I wonder if that'll be a bit of an issue. Ivory Coast having that little extra bit of a oomph, if you will, right? That extra firepower in their back pocket, helping them through these drafts, uh, helping them correct. Even if they lose a game, right? You have someone that's kind of keeping a bird's eye view over the match and can kind of like try to correct that heading into the next match. And I feel like that's always such a super advantageous thing to have in your corner. Of course. The coach can tell you a mistake from miles away while the player can basically almost never see a small mistake that can change the whole game. Like, basically, pick a wrong pick, the coach is going to tell you that this pick can counter that. Everything is going to be the drafter. He's going to bring the team morale up. You're not doing this for your country. You're going to make your cows brought as well. And right now, we're going to take a look at the group standings. Because that uh, Senegal has two points and Ivory Coast has two points and Nigeria and Ghana both of them being at a deficit of two points. That's right and again we'll be getting to see Ivory Coast they should uh be able to move up unless they obviously get swept here it'll be interesting to see if they'll be able to overclaim and take this first spot they're tied up currently right uh with Senegal so they don't have Nigeria oh I guess Nigeria Nigeria and Senegal played okay Makes sense then, I guess. Senegal and Nigeria played Ghana. Ivory Coast played. And then we'll get Ivory Coast second match and Senegal second match. So they'll be through halfway through their day after this series here. Um, so we'll, we'll have a pretty good understanding or sense of where this is going to go in between these two teams after the second series of the Africa Regional Qualifiers for day two. I can't wait to see the match starting. It's going to be intense. Both number one spots right now are Senegal and Ivory. The second vote would be Nigeria and Ghana. We're going to see who's going to be third in the leaderboard and who's going to be fourth as well. But we're going to see who's going to be first and second, which is going to be the most interesting part. And yeah. I am very excited, actually, to see what these two teams, both of these teams, won their first game. Maybe they can change the outcome. We saw nothing about Senegal so far. I heard nothing. I'm excited to see what they can do. I want them to show me how strong of a team they are. I mean, it already got them one win, right? Uh, up against uh, Nigeria there, that's all, if I'm not mistaken. So we get to see that. But speaking of things, we get to see we're heading over to the pick and ban phase. Here's the coda for the second series. In between, like you said, number one and number two, one of them are going to be moving up or moving down based on how these matches go. Of course. And you can see Ivory Coast already banning all that Faramis. We saw how dangerous the Faramis can be. He can choose to negate most of the damage with the enemies. And we see that Fanny ban for Mikasa, probably. We saw how much she likes to play Fanny, or he likes to play Fanny. And another Atlas ban from the side of Ivory Coast. This is going to be the second ban in the whole tournament, I believe. Yeah, 
going to be very, very interesting to see how this will go, especially because we have Ivory Coast back on the board again. Of course, With ready their, for the uh, unique style of draft. Of course, ready for that fourth ban, which is going to be a Valentina. And let's see the fifth and sixth ban. I, I'm thinking it's going to be either a Joy or an Arlot. Of course. Even so, I would even put my, my finger on the gun and call it a Kaja ban. That's all I have to see. Team Ivory Coast is going to be the first pick of the series today. And it would be in their favor to pick something that can give them a little advantage. Just how, how dangerous an Arlot can be. Basically took no damage and he dealt a lot of damage while he was fighting. And these teams are really loving to ban out this uh this Atlas here. Cause I really have to focus on that. Like it seems almost like how Melissa was for day one. I mean, Melissa's still getting banned out, but it feels like uh, this Atlas is like a Melissa 2.0 as far as bans and, and like priority in between these teams. And we are going to see a Diggy ban for the third time today. Probably Team Ivory Coast is leaning against that Minotaur again. We saw how dangerous uh, uh, Seraphine is on that Minotaur. We saw that four man seat. Going to be intense, but They're it's going to be found out by Team Senegal. I will choose my own and bring to the Arrow I've talked about the hands of Beerus. Oh, this is funny. I, I find that so hilarious that the middle gets banned out. And actually, the middle and Atlas have just been like back and forth, right? So both of those tanks have been locked in a lot. First. But I'll them off the boards. We'll see. Now we'll see Ivory Coast and uh nigeria here really stretch into those roam pulls and see kind of what they like to go for here something no interesting to note ivory coast uh was one of the teams they banned out when, in the match they banned out the estus and diggy ghana banned out estus against them now minotaur and atlas have been taken off the board do we potentially see them pick up the estus here because now there's not too much punishment for cc except for things like maybe a a lolita uh, potentially being slotted up they might go for an estus somewhere in this draft of course, but there's also Joy still being on the table, but Melissa, Melissa leads to the cracks. Finally, for the first time, then she's not getting banned. I'm going to see in the hands of Vincenzo. I hope it's going to be intense. The Beatrix, the Brody, the Cloth still on the table, and probably a Kagura to counter those oh, wow. RCC stunts. And the Lolita you were talking about. Interesting, interesting. Goes. I, that's it, so crazy. The, the Kagura is so early. Kagura is so early, but still, Joy is open. Uh, Balmond still open. Maybe glue. even a ban. Glue <laughs> as well, but the glue is not. We saw him left open in both of the first games. Which is very yeah. interesting. Very interesting. Even so, I would Maybe. say Joy is a much more dangerous pick in the hands of a good player. Her anti CC, her tankiness, her damage, her life still, magical life still, actually. It's going to be intense. Can counter that lit, I can counter the Mars, but we're going to see the walking refrigerator Frederin getting banned. Joining his brother the deep freezer in the ban ban section. Yeah, this is this is gonna be a very interesting way to see how the second half of the draft goes. But they're still banning out uh or banning out a jungle here from the side of Nigeria, which isn't a bad call. They already have their Martis. I do find it weird that they banned out the Fredrin just because a lot of times Martis was, was geared up to go into wrong. the Fredrin. Um, one of his comfortable spots, the Martis Akai happened to be one of the answers or, you know, Lancelot as well into the Fredrin. So a little weird they banned it out, but maybe just don't want to have to deal with it, even though they do have a bit of counterplay, just don't want to deal with the walking fridge. He is extremely strong. Um, they also banned out that Fanny, though. That was, I think that's a valid ban. We saw Mikasa Ackerman have the 808, right? The flawless game to complete the sweep uh, with the MVP Fanny. So some decent bans, at least for the jungle. I wonder if they'll double down on it. Uh, and if they do, what exactly they go for? Like, I, I feel like you still can go for the Lance. If you can play the Fanny, you can probably play the tanks a lot. And I feel like that'd be a good matchup for them. Even uh, so, to the get league, into the back lines. The Link is still a very good pick right now. We don't have that much. Count, uh, got to control for him. He's very agile, but we're going to see a Franco ban. Mm. And something interesting is that is the Akai, which combos extremely well with the uh, Arlo. Every push from Akai, it's considered a, 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 a CC for Arlo, so he can dash on and on and on. He can be pinned against Hall, and Arlo can just dash continuously, not stopping him, just melting the enemies down. That paired up with the damage Arlo is going to be very interesting, actually. 
I mean, a, a lot of time to figure out what exactly is going to get used and picked up here. Clint, though, is going to get banned out. And that is correct. I think that's Clint's second ban now. He's that's been correct. played one so far in day two. So Clint, a hot pick right now, or a high priority target. That's so interesting. But also, Somni, I noticed that Melissa can actually help Arlot as well. So I think they're going to build a team around Arlot. But they're going to see that cloud I was talking about that basically counter Melissa in the early game, even so in the late game. But we're going to see a barely getting shown that can actually do a bit of damage against that cloud. Yeah, I just. Ooh. <laughs> Belleric. Actually locked in. I, I thought this was going to be a hover, but no. I mean, Belleric. Belleric. To the cloud. I mean, it's not bad. It could work. He could get down on the Lolita, maybe cancel out her ultimate. Mark, he can soak up a lot of damage from the Alice, from the Marches. It could work out. Depends how he's being played, of course. I like the Belleric for the neutral objectives. He's really strong over the Lord and Turtles because you just stand in the way. You throw down the Wrath of the Arab, and then it's just, you know, immediate taunt effect, right? It's extremely hard, especially for the melee characters to keep Which progressing forward. But for. speaking of melee, the Barats got locked in for Mixa Ackerman. Not a pick I see too much of anymore, but it's definitely a warm welcome. And of course, leave it up to Ivory Coast to pull out something a little unconventional here with the Belleric and the Barats combination. There was also the Estes option of being picked out in combination with the Barats. We saw how dangerous that can be by the professional team Black. We just saw how much an Estes and a Barats can tank. They can combo great. Together, and we saw that S is getting banned in the first and second game against Team Ivory Coast. That's right, but here we are loading up can't wait, into can't the game wait. here in between these two teams. Definitely can't wait. Definitely highly anticipate it. Get to see Senegal here for the first time. And then, again, Ivory Coast, a back to back feature, back to back special. We saw them in the first series. What a treat that was. And we're going to keep getting to see them play here. Dakota loading right on in now. I think just waiting on one more player to slowly hit that 100% mark there. Low and steady wins the race. Of course, of course. But also, Arlot with a killing spree emblem, that means he's probably going to be full damage, Arlot, which is super intense. But he's also paired up with a Petrify instead of the Flicker. And here we go, right? Game one, series two. For day two, the Africa Regional Qualifiers. You got Ivory Coast on the blue side, taking up Senegal on the red. Can't wait to get this game started. I am feeling hyped. They're already looking to make a play. <laughs> right out of the bush. Ooh, look at this. Alice going to the mid lane to get a bit more stacks on her passive. Interesting, interesting. Hmm. Is that That's exactly what that was? Is that what yeah. we were seeing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, she was just going to clear the minions to get plus four stack from the minions. I've seen it a lot in rank play, actually. Very interesting, but that allows the Arlo to get a bit more farming. But we can see that Team Senegal already claimed that Little Wanderer. They were missing, maybe. If the Alice would stay for a Little Wanderer as well, that would have been a bit more useful, but we can see that Vicenzo is taking care of that walking salad, as we like to call it in the MLBB community, and we can see that basically they're just poking at each other. We can see that Alice is getting low, but she's going to get at stacks either way. Arlot is just denying her the farm, and in the bottom lane, we can see already gathering up, maybe to take a clean kill on the Claude, on our man, Death Gun KD. I want to see how his reflex circus on Cloud. Usually, you need very fast reflexes to get that dodging. But they're just playing extremely positively, actually. They could have went for a kill maybe on the Lolita, even so, maybe on the Cloud with that bars. Him getting level 4 still be a free kill. Maybe they could have put the bot lane tower. But that's left to be seen. We can see the top lane, the Alice is recalling. You can see Marty is fighting that uh, Arlut 1v1 and he's winning. Interesting, interesting. Very interesting, but we got the Lord coming up for grabs, up for contention here. It's half HP, here's the Coda. It doesn't like either team wants to back away. Against that, the Eve uses the real manipulation, catches two players, and we can see that Beerus is striking the Eve 
just pushing away, not allowing her to get anything in the team fights. But she gets the kill on Beerus on Arlot, and against the Alice is just slowing that Paras down. And the Lolita goes into the Numinan Blast. It's a stun on Numi and the Barats. The Barats uses the Tonas Vulcan, but the Marches dashes away. That was a turtle and two kills, I believe, for Team Senegal. Which is a nice start for them and an uncomfortable spot for Ivory Coast to be in right now. Not where we normally seen them. But they did go behind in the first game of the first series. They were able to turn things around, able to come up huge in a extremely long game, almost 30 minute match. So if a team can right the wrongs, it's definitely them. We just see how Melissa is playing extremely positively against Cloud, her counterpart, I would say. He's the revealing of the bush. He can just push away and he has that vengeance, which allows him to dunk a bit more damage from that Melissa. They're getting at the bottom, there's four members from Team Senegal and four members from Ivory Coast. All of them playing around their uh, composing marksmen. But against that, the Barats is just zoning out, giving a bit more vision, and they're all going towards the middle and probably going to push the tower a little bit. They can't counter in. Maybe the Kagura can get the open umbrella and uh, clean them out. But against that, the Lolita with the Nominant Blast gets a stun on the Ooh. Kagura and locked inside the real manipulation, gets a kill on the Kagura, getting that uh, Eve to a two and one assist AD. That's why the Lolita and Eve is such a feared combination. A good Numium Blast on top of a real world manipulation is definitely a one way track to Painville. And that's exactly what Yumi just found out the hard way. Is now he's 0 2 and 0, having a rough start to this game. The mid laner for Ivory Coast is going to have to step it up here. We are seeing the Lolita trying to back out, get that uh, mana back for that turtle fight, probably. Cloud just spoke in the Melissa, pushing her away, getting as much most important thing for her, a Demon Hunter sword. He can melt the Barat better, even the Arlot, which is a bit tankier in the early to mid to late game. And he just picked that up as well. On top of the Ice Cream one into the hands of Yakuza on this Eve. Both of them on par for a nice item spike. I always like when Eve's go for the Ice Cream one over the book. I feel like you're able to rush into your utility a lot. Like a, a Rafelia, a Mathilda. Barats needs that extra mobility. Otherwise, he's just a slow moving uh, addition, new addition to the Jurassic Park collection. And just like the rest of the dinosaurs, goes extinct in game one here. And, and honestly, just like the Meteor Wars, really wiped them out. Single did not waste too much time with Ivory Coast, who looked like a dominating team for Series 1, but looks like they might have met their match, Dakota. I think so, but we saw the draft, even with the coach, the draft was a bit lacking. They were trying to go for those unplayed heroes, but maybe Team Senegal expected and they just went for the meta picks, for the Cloud, for the Martis, even so, even for the Alice to counter the Arlot in the top lane, in the XP lane. Even, maybe if the Arlot had a different I mean, maybe if the Arlot could have done something, maybe if he had a flicker, he could have done, uh, went in for the battery, get some picks, but we can have all maybes in the world, but that didn't happen. It's very unfortunate. I would have hoped for a longer game. Been a lot smoother in the late game for the Melissa, I would say. Even with the Cloud on the team, she would have been able to melt both the Martis and the uh, Cloud, even the Alice. Would have been a free target for him but also oh, yeah. it was a bit of an out draft from team senegal in my personal opinion yeah definitely out out played in the draft and then even in the macro right not even a tower was touched by the side of ivory coast even when you have a underhanded draft still should be able to play around and find objectives but coming up short but here we are looking at these stats maybe it'll give us a little more information on kind of how that went through and there's the martyrs that we were kind of talking about also went for that hunter axe and that bloodlust that you kind of harped on about that a lot of the martyrs players were using didn't switch to the defense interesting enough he had such a strong game but speaking of strong game look at him picking up the turtle here as we transition over to the replays and you're just gonna see uh, this happen time and time again right seeing Senegal overwhelmed them the numium blast from the elitist the combination we we're talking about you paired up with the eve it is so dominating so controlling here we saw this is probably the most fight back we saw from the side of ivory coast was beerish trying to sustain that 1v3 obviously ended up falling but that was the most fight back they had look at the control that they were able to provide martis picking up that lord with no one even in contest all the members being held back it's probably a shining moment 
or the side of Ivory Coast, and she's picking up the double kill. But after that, they don't pick up much else. I think they finished with five kills, and this was at the nine minute mark. And five minutes later, or four minutes later, they still have the four kills. So definitely <laughs> weren't able to do a lot here, Dakota. But even so, they played extremely well. But it was, I think, the fighter's fault from my perspective. He had that uh, assassin man who was building tanks, was building the tanky arrow build, which is a bit untraditional with um, uh, assassin emblem. If he had the, the tenancy emblem, maybe he could have done something. But you almost see that Marty is getting that maniac, but the fountain was able to outheal his damage, which is unfortunate. But that was it for game number one versus uh, Senegal versus Ivory Coast. I can't wait for the second one. Maybe we're going to see the redemption of Ivory Coast. We are going to see a better job. Maybe we're going to see some heroes that we haven't seen. Palmon still on the table. <laughs> that I'm really hoping for. Even the Alpha or Bane I'm, I'm hopeful for. But there is not much to say. But we are heading into the second game. And we're going to start with that funny ban again targeting Mikasa. Yeah, I mean, Fanny gets taken off the board, which is good. I mean, it's a respect ban. Mix the Ackman over there. Great Fanny player. So uh, not too much really to talk about on that. It's really, it, honestly, it's a standard ban everywhere else. Just over here in Africa hasn't been too much of a standard. But in this game, definitely something you got to ban out uh, up against Mikasa. I didn't cure the of course, are we seeing the Faramis and the Valentina ban each their own strengths. Valentina being able to change down for the game with one ultimate. The Mark is being a respect ban. We saw how dangerous Mark is in the hands of Kulani. Not a single worthy and I'm hoping to see some off-brand junglers. There isn't really buff Baron. Both of us were talking about. Both of us, I think, tried it out. We saw how dangerous and how strong he was. But that's all left to be seen in the draft. And we're going to see that Minotaur ban. Interesting, interesting, interesting ban. Yeah, I mean, Mino gets vanned out. Honestly, at this point, I feel like, at least for this region, it's Pretty normal, right? Very standard. Uh, I like the Martis ban. It seems they love prowling Martis out here in the Africa regional qualifiers. I mean, he's definitely a strong jungler still, but I've never seen him picked or banned this much uh, since, like, the hype of him, like when Leo Moore had got his buff, and they were both just running around Martis and Leo. Uh, but over here, man, he is extremely contested. A pick, though, that did slip through was Melissa. Um, but they lock in Alice first pick. Again, Diablo on that. saw how strong he was to go versus in the lane. He, he just zoned out the enemies. He, they couldn't do nothing to her. She had a lot of healing. She had a lot of sustain. And we're going to see the chance on the Melissa and maybe looking to redeem himself. That's going to be interesting. Another Melissa first pick that the cloud still being left on the table, probably going to be the next pick of Team Senegal. Yes, I mean, honestly, do they really want to go for the Melissa here again? They just used it last game, and Senegal obviously had the answers of the Melissa, and a lot of them are still on the board. I mean, they picked up Alice. We know that's going to go XP. They do lock the Melissa, but again, the mid lane is still open. So something like Farsa is available, Eve is available, Lancelot is still on the table, Claude is still on the table, uh, even like a Harith, like they want to get really crazy out here and pull a Harith gold lane. Like there's a lot of answers to Melissa right now, um, a like a Leslie. <laughs> there's a lot to have to deal with picking this Melissa so early. And look, there, there's the Claude being hovered over right now. Something interesting you said, Alice can be also used in the mid lane if you play her well enough. She's gonna get a bit more stacks in the early game, allowing her to have a bigger snowball towards the late. There is the room for other fighter, even so maybe for a jungler to pick in or like Alice jungle it still works. I've seen it being used, but that's highly unlikely because we're going to see the tank Lancelot you're talking about getting picked. And let's see that the third pick of Team Ivory Coast, I think, is either going to be an XP laner or a jungler. That's what I, I personally would pick. I would let the, the rumor towards the later pick of the game. And we're going to see the walking refrigerator, Frederick getting kicked. Big counter towards that Lancelot, even so towards that uh, Claude. Yeah, this is, this is really crazy, honestly. Looking at the drafting here. Um, I do feel like Ivory Coast need just they had to make an adjustment on the gold lane. I can't believe they went for the Melissa again. Um, and just like I said, the Claude and Lance come out right. The immediate counters like Melissa's good, but she's not 
first swing that good. You can't just pick Melissa and just, you know, just be ready to profit. It's not like a Beatrix. Like, Beatrix, you can pick nice and early. She's versatile. She doesn't really have any losing trades uh, in lane. She's just very consistent, very reliable. Melissa is not the same. There are plenty of counters for Melissa. And we already have three of them on the board right here. And two of them came after she got locked in. So I just, I'm not really sure what the thought process there. Uh, was I know they have the coach in their pocket, but I, I really feel like an adjustment was needed, or at least like give it some time, right? Maybe in the second phase, Melissa probably gets banned out since they already know they like to use it. But at least you don't get stuck in this this yeah, trap where you have to play man, Melissa now, but you also have to play Melissa into all the counters. But something interesting I noticed is that one one wasn't banned or picked. One and being the most versatile hero, having that two point five second ultimate. Every time she gets a kill, she gets another second on that ultimate uh, skill. It would be a very good pick for the side of Ivory Coast versus that uh, Cloud, maybe even that Alice. She's hell she could sustain a lot. She could get that much needed damage support in air support, if you could, if you could call it. But right now, I think they're going to ban another fight, not another fighter, another Roamer probably for a side of Senegal. A fighter or a mage of Farsa would be very good to ban, but that would leave Yumi known to, to, to take out easily but we're going to that Lolita getting picked you saw how dangerous she was in the hands of Kimp interesting interesting name but let's see what the last and final ban will be probably a fight probably Lapu Lapu probably Arlot Arlot still not banned or Joy even are not banned yet they're not and they're gonna go free Arlot and Joy are on the board and they banned out Exaborg I haven't seen an Xborg ban or pick in a extremely long time, so very strange to see. They lock in the Kufra. And looking at those big boys, you know, something I was thinking about that they really, really could have used, right? Uh, instead of this Fredrin, Akai would have been really good. Akai and Melissa pair so well together. Akai pairs well for the Kadita with the heavy spin, and then it goes well up against the Lance, but whoa, whoa, there goes Diggy, so maybe that might have been the problem. But there is actually a very big problem. Both the walking refrigerator, Kadita, and we're going to see the second Valir. Wow. I think they like to play Valir in Africa. Interesting. We don't see him a lot in Europe, and I don't think you guys see him a lot in North America. But there is still Joy, Arlot, Lapu Lapu, Yujong on the table, which is interesting to, to let them out so freely, I would, get, I would say. This is, I don't know. This is really strange. Not seeing, I, I like. I wonder. Will we, like, will neither one get picked up? Glue also isn't being touched. Is did the? I, I don't know. Did the balance really make people this uh this allergic to those three picks? Glue, Joy, Arlot, both free. Are we really gonna see a game with neither one? Okay, here we go. There's Arlot. Jeez, I was gonna say that. That'd be insane. So there is three picks. I would expect Choi to be picked a bit more than the arrows, actually. Her being a bit more versatile, she has that dash. She can go in after chasing behind. She can do a lot of things. She has a, a lot of movement, a lot of sustain, a lot of damage, a lot of poke. She's basically one of the best XP laners in my eyes. So you don't see her picked so often in Africa. We've seen the Kadita, we've seen the Melissa, we've seen the Valir before, but we've never seen a Joy. Yeah, I don't know. Very, very unique uh, drafting and region that we got going on right now for the Africa qualifiers for IESF. I can't wait to see how we will play. But I see an emblem that's surprising. Most Stromers had the same emblem. The one that uh, Kufra has, I forgot its name. But most drummers have the one that heals you after you get a stun, which is interesting. It gives them a bit, a bit more sustain, but you see Arlut the assassin with a killing spree again. Interesting, interesting emblems. Welcome to Mobile Legends. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, here we go, though. Starting up for the second match. Senegal currently having Ivory Coast in the pit. One to zero. Will Ivory Coast be able to adjust? They kind of steered away from the unorthodox drafting this game, so maybe getting a little more serious 
with their coach right now, they're going to look to reset and go 1-1. One, one. Probably, but there's a lot of interesting emblems I'm seeing. Or we can, we're going to see that Alice play again, clearing that minion, getting that those four stacks in the early game. We see that Melissa with a killing spell, and we see that Diggy with a mystery shop is looking to build damage to poke out that Melissa. It's very interesting picks and emblems. I don't see them so often in my region, I don't know about you. But we can see that the lead to Wanderer is almost uncontested. The Lancelot will get, will get it. Kufra is getting poked hard, he's already half HP. But that's normal for a roamer to be half HP in the early game. But for now, it's very passive. In the mid lane, there is the Kadita, there is the Valor fighting it out. The Diggy is helping, giving a bit more vision, putting some bombs in the bushes, waiting for them to pass through. Yeah, and this is going to be interesting to see this Diggy in Valir pick. I mean, they have a lot of poke, and I feel like that's going to be a hard thing for Ivory to deal with. Uh, they're going to be looking for these engagements, right? With Fredrin, with the Kufra, with our lot. All of them have big opening acts. I like to call them big opening act moves. Uh, the final slash, obviously the Tyrich Rage and Revenge combination. Oh, but look at this. There's a lot of poke going that Fredrin. The Fredrin is going to use the Appraiser app, but he misses it. And he's going to get claimed out by Kilo and the Lancelot, the Thorn Rose, is doing a lot of damage in the early game. And they're going to have a few objectives, seeing the jungler is going to take a long while to get back. And they're going to get almost one level advantage soon if the Lancelot gets that creep in. Or if he doesn't decide to go for it, but you see that Beerus already doesn't have level 3. They're trying to contest the turtle. The Kufra is going to be getting vision. We see Diggy in the mid lane bush waiting to get a, a very nice focus one. We see him using it on Seraphine, and they're going, and the Fredger in Mikasa is getting that object, that neutral objective, that turtle. It's going to help a lot in the early game because that in the top lane hasn't been visited. The marksmen are battling it out there, getting a lot of gold in. But we can see right now that Arlot has just reached level 4 and the Alice has basically free roam. She's getting a lot of gold in. And the top lane, the Claude is just doing a lot of clean work. But he's going to back out probably. But we can see that the Valor is trying to steal the buff and he manages to steal that red buff from Frederin. Very, very, very lucky. Very lucky or very skilled. Just gotta get good over there if you're Fredrin. Had the and ends up losing it out. So Senegal again putting the pressure to Ivory Coast. Not a position they've been in too many times. We talked about it in series one. They were able to come back last game. We thought maybe they still had a shot since they fall in the deficit before. But again, the deficit just kept getting larger and larger and larger. It went from 2k all the way up to almost 10k at one point. So definitely not somewhere they want to be right now. Yes, but we see that Bali just stealing that buff will mega Fredrin lose a lot of farm. We see that the Lancelot is almost one level higher than the Fredrin if he goes decides to clear that bot lane, that red buff. We can see that the Arlot is getting pushed. The Diggy is just annoying them as much as he can. He's getting that stun, that mark on both of them, but he loses the dash. The, they're just ignoring the bot lane completely, which is uh, very, very insane. Just, they're missing out of a lot of XP, but the Arlot is two level higher almost than the Alice. Actually, not that much. He just got a minion in. So this is the Arlot is trying to get a little wonder, maybe giving it to Seraphine to get a bit more vision, maybe to get a bit more rotation on the map. So it's just a lot going on. <laughs> the the Valerie picks are incredible. I He's a very good hero and he's a bit annoying, could say that. He just has a lot of pushback, a lot of slow, a lot of CC. And we can see that the Lancer is getting ready to take that turtle. Will he able, be able to claim that objective? It means that the Kadita is waiting to go for a kill. The Kufra goes and gets that Valir stun. Tries to go away, but doesn't. The Fredrin gets that uh, retribution off. Kadita is forced to ultimate. Goes for that clean. The, for the Claude, I mean. But he she misses everything. But against that, Vincenzo is reclaiming himself, getting a kill on uh, Pimp. Ooh. And Beer is getting a kill on Diablo. And Vincenzo getting a double kill on. Uh, a triple kill actually on the, the Lancelot and the Valir, and we can start with a 1 for 3 trade, which is very, very profitable for the side of Ivory Coast. And I mean, now the Melissa coming alive for them for Ivory Coast, and she's off to a great start. Something though, I want to point out that that killing spree, right? So that's very unique on the Melissa here. That's not really, it's normally the weakness finder um, that's picked up on Melissa, or at least. Uh, not the um, electro flash, 
even one of those two. The killing spree is extremely different, not typical on your Melissa here, but three, zero, and one can't argue with the stats here. We can set the gap. It's there's 1k gold ahead for Ivory Coast. Actually, 700 gold, my mistake, but still, they already taken the lead back, as you said. A one mistake made him uh, to take that gold lead back against that. Big is trying to get a kill on Vincenzo, but the Lancelot will claim it. There is two members of Team Ivory going towards the top lane. You can set the Kaiser is just zoning him out. You can set the Cloud is pushing the threat, gets it destroyed, backs out. The Frederick is trying to go in, get a stun, gets a, the flicker on Valor gets away just poking them and annoying them is just what Valor is made for being an annoying hero like uh, Frederick and getting a lot of stuns and being the baking oven making them slow making them get stunned it's very incredible that he's placed in his drafting like uh, there's no other uh, major would think better the first would have been better but she's just stuck in one place and the Karita is going to get a free pick off we can start the lance so it's actually taunting them in the mid lane Probably going to get this objective. The Frederick is there, the Arrows is there, and the Mage is there, but they have Diggy, which can basically cancel out all of the CC, and the Alice is on his way. Get a pick off on Yumi, and he's going to get the Retribution. Diablo actually gets the kill on the Turtle. We can see the Melissa is the both time porking the Frederick out. The Lancelot is going to poke him out, and the Valor is going to claim the life of Frederick, the Walking Refrigerant of Mikasa. The blue is up for grab, but we can use that the arrow is defending it, getting Ooh. a kill on Yakuza, and we can see that the Kufra is going in trying to jump on the dig, it gets connect. And we can see just from now on there's just going to be a bit of stable gameplay. There's not much taken to both of the junglers are almost oh actually none of junglers are dead, just the mage is dead. They can't engage as many fans as they could before. We can see that the top lane and the bot lane third have been pushed, which is a very big boost for the team of Senegal. Right now, the mid lane is also looking to push. Also, none of the turrets, like in the last game, have been touched at all. Yeah, they haven't, and that's not what you want to see, right? If you're the side of Ivory Coast, they were able to find... Yeah, they have kills now. They're magic up a bit, but you have to find the objective. They're not finding towers. They lost the lost last turtle. And I have to say, even before the fights break out, I mean, look at the HP bar. They have been poking and chipping away at them. Speaking of that last hurdle, Valir Yakuza did such a great job with those steering turns and the knockback, being able to control that pit. They kept them CC for so long. They had Yumi on the dive, died on contact with so low HP when Yumi finally committed for the kill. And that's and the strength of this Diggy and Valir combination. And we can set a mid lane tower finally, it falls down. There's just a lot of map control from the side of Senegal. They they are not going for the story push. They're always out rotating. Team Ivory Coast are going to clear those minion waves all the time. They're not letting the minions get even close to the turrets. But there is also a possible pick off for Yumi and Arnold. Maybe a good ultimate and a well placed push if I can knock that uh, Alice out. Getting a kill, getting I think not not getting a shutdown. She doesn't have a kill yet, but still. That's going to be a lot of gold going towards uh, Ivory Coast. That's a shutdown on one of the most important members of Team Senegal. You can see that the Lancelot is trying to go for a turtle object. The Frederick is there. Gets stunned by Dallas. Is he going to claim the, the objective? He is, but he's going to use the retribution a bit earlier. That would have been a side of mistake. If the Frederick was allowed to get close, but the Alice was just keeping him at bay, pushing him away as far as she could. And against that, they're invading the blue buff of Frederick of Mikasa. We know how strong the Alice is, that blue buff, we can see that the rough waves uh, pop off, the petrifies go off, there's still a lot of damage getting tanked by Diablo, getting a lot of kills, the Kufra is getting pulled back by the Diggy, the, the, the Valor is just there to slow them down as much as he could, there's just a lot going on in the bottom lane, the Lord is going as fast as he can, in the top lane, the minions are pushing on their own, in the mid lane, the mid lane tower falls, there's nothing much they can do, this looks like a super early end, but you can see the Arlo with the final slash gets two people in the tower, the Diggy managed to flicker away, and the Alice just doesn't get hurt at all. She has a lot of sustain. The Valor is just there, just giving a lot of damage. The uh, Lancelot goes in, gets a kill, and the uh, another kill on the Beerus. And we can see that the Kalita is forced to use Rough Wave. The Kufra is there, jumps on Lancelot. The Frederick is there to poke him out. And there's another kill for Diablo. And there's just the bot lane, top lane getting pushed at the same time. Mid lane getting pushed by Diablo and Yakuza. The Markman is pushing with the Lord. Yumi is there and she doesn't have ultimate, she doesn't have petrify. 
and Frenchy is just getting poked out. They can do nothing. The, there is just a four versus four right now. Big is on his way, and that's oh. a GG for Team Senegal. That was incredible. That the was sweet there. That was very good macro and micro management for the team of Senegal. That was uh, honestly probably the best game I've seen. The best two games of team today, and from the other day as well. But they it were in defense. Good. It was clean. There was not that many mistakes. Even with the coach, even if they had the coach, they showed that if they don't have a coach, if they only the coach, they can win on their own. They can make decision on their own. That was just an insane play from Team Senegal. Definitely an extremely uh, smart team. I mean, they kept the momentum from game one going into game two. And like I said, I think they even I think they played game two even better than they played game one. Uh, the draft was nice. They played it well, uh, really strong. But we're going to go ahead and look at these after match stats here, taking a quick look at the leaderboard and seeing what all led to that. And look at that Diablo on the Alice is going to pick up the MVP. But honestly, I think the unsung heroes that composition really do go into the position five and four that diggy and valir combination chef's kiss it was so strong up against Ser uh sephiroth here on the kufra on beerus with the with the r-line and especially up against miksa ackerman it's just a, a whole stone wall here it was so good and we can see some of that because we're going to head over to the replays now from for the match dakota can't wait. We can start in the early game. The Lancelot was just poking out their jungler. Getting that early shadow on the Frenchman meant a lot for Team Senegal. Okay, he lost the buffs, a lot of mob control, but you can see that in the fights, Beerus is just going in, getting as much damage as he can. But he's getting melted. Even so, they, they got a triple kill in the early game that Melissa got a triple kill, but it meant nothing towards the later game. You can see that the Claude has never fallen in the early game. We can see that the turtle getting uh, uh, stolen by Diablo, not by Frenchman, which is actually interesting both of the junglers meter retribution but still that's a turtle for the side of senegal there's just a lot going on none of the turrets were touched by team ivory coast in neither of the games we just see virus falling at the uh, i mean yakuza falling at the hands of virus you can see that they're just poking and look how much tank and as diablo can really do he can just go in the jungle and with no repercussions get a lot of kills get a lot of damage get a lot of abilities get a lot of utility out you can see that the killer is just getting two kills in their own jungle. The Beerus uh, can't do much. Vicenzo dies as well. We can see Diablo getting that kill on Seraphim. Mikasa Ackerman gets a kill on Lancelot. Gets that shutdown, but they can't do much. There is just Frederick and uh, Harita to defend. If they had a bit more time, maybe two, three more seconds, Meli allowing Melissa to spawn, getting that good ultimate in. But that wasn't the case. By the, by the time Melissa spawned in, the game was already over. Which was very, very intense. That's right. And what a clean victory. What a clean sweep, like you said. I do have to say, though, this is crazy. African regional qualifiers, the land of sweeps. Every single match has been a sweep. You could argue the case that we didn't really get to see how Series 3 would go from day one, since that did end early in a forfeit. But with there being no loss taken from the winning team, I think that still counts as a sweep. So we're on our, what, fifth? our fifth series that has been a sweep very crazy <laughs> none of the teams were able to contest all the teams are strong but some of them are just better in the ways of macro and micro management that's the most inter good that i've seen the african players being good at micro and macro they have very good map positioning but they, they have just this intense uh, micro looking at the map getting a lot of knowledge and the macro for the skills and everything else, it's actually pretty noticeable in the eyes of, uh, I would say, I'm a good, decent player, maybe. I played with a lot of good players, I've seen a lot of good players, I've looked at almost all of the major tournaments, I've seen what good players do, what they look at, and that was just at your level, I would say, but of course, you can't judge a book by its cover, so we're waiting to see on that last uh, game of the day. But right now we're going to head into a break and after that we're going to see the games.
All right, so we are back with game number three, last game of the day, and it's going to be Nigeria versus Ivory Coast. We've seen Ivory Coast three times today, Deku. What do you think about that? We haven't seen any other team competing versus each other. That's a bit interesting. We haven't, but we are getting to see how Ivory Coast stacks up against the rest of these teams. They had a sweep, got swept, and now they're going to be heading into their last match up against Nigeria. And we'll get to see them for the first time. So it's always, we always get one one time, one, one of these teams for the first time, and then we get Ivory Coast to just keep on going and tumbling on. They're doing like a gauntlet right now. <laughs> the gauntlet, or they're trying to win, but they keep failing and failing. But I, I hope maybe this time they'll turn it around. We've seen what they can do. We've seen their draft. We know that they have a pretty, I would say, uh, unexpected coach with his picks. But right now, I am hyped to see Nigeria versus Ivory Coast. I know what Mikasa can do. I've seen, I've seen him. I've seen her. Maybe I don't know. I, I haven't asked. But I've seen him or her claim objectives. Like there's not more play. Fine. Like there's not more. They did extremely well in the jungle department. But I can't wait to see what Team Nigeria will do. And right, right now. We are. Well, you say it, you say that. <laughs> I'll go ahead. We got a, looking at our teams here on the leaderboards. We got Senegal in first place, right? 2-0 and in the win-loss column. They're sitting at four points. But then we have Ivory Coast tied up with Nigeria as well. And now looking over here at the divisions, obviously talking about this already, Northern Africa, day one for the African Regional Qualifiers. Egypt secured their spot. Today, we're looking to see who's going to be able to take the second spot to go out and look at this we're already heading into the draft Dakota and we heard this yeah funny and the farmies ban the respect ban for Mikasa again the going is that uh, a funny she's very agile she has a lot of damage early game and towards the mid lane mid game excuse me but you also have the farmies which is very dangerous in any team fight that he walks himself into Need some stitches? That's right. And look at this. The Melissa ban again. How many times are we going to see the Puppet Master get taken off the board in between these teams and the Africa <laughs> Regional <laughs> Qualifiers, man? I can't, I, she, we saw her two times today, if I'm not mistaken. I only seen her do great. And at the end, she just stumbles down the hill and won't do anything else. But we're going to see the second link ban of today, another assassin ban from the side of Nigeria. And right now we're going to wait for the third ban. Uh, and it's going to be marked. And let's see the last ban until the first drafting phase. And I think it's going to be either uh, a Farsa or oh, it's going to be an Arlot, actually. A ban out our lot, and again, we still have a lot of those picks, at least that we thought were still really good. But look at this first pick, Minotaur, Minotaur. into the hands of no other, though. It's in the hands of Seraphi, and that was the four man Minoan Fury that we saw earlier to close out that sweep for them in the second series of the day. So, this is a pretty comfortable pick, if you ask me. Yeah, but we see that Biggie getting picked and the carry alongside of it. We've seen how first pick tanks do usually and led up to a bit of a loss, but we're going to see an Hanabi. That's very, very interesting. I have never seen a Hanabi pick in Egypt or any other region so far. But we're going to see that Alice. It's how dangerous that Alice was in the hands of a good Alice player. From Team Senegal, he just destroyed everyone in his path they couldn't do nothing about him diablo was the master of alice was going for good rotations but right now let's see what is going to be in the hands of yumi yeah this is really interesting here this provides quite the issue for this minoan fury here not only do you have to play around the time or uh time journey but you also have to play around hanabi's passive you're not going to be able to cc her and on top of that you get additional shield from the time journey so even in those team fights even if you are able to get rid of the shield if diggy pops the time journey hanabi gets more shield so you can't pop it during the mist of the time journey you're not you're probably not gonna be able to pop it afterwards it, that's gonna be really tough for them to find a set onto hanabi here and you know i know you said you haven't seen it but Fortunately or unfortunately enough over at NACT, we actually had a team quite famed for playing the Hanabi, so I can't say I'm not used to seeing it, but I am a little shocked that I get to see it on the other side of the world today. But 
you you would see Hanab do it in Aegis, but not do it in Inspire. That's the most interesting part of that pick. She benefits yeah, a lot from Aegis, but there is the dig of hers. And we're going to see the Valentina getting banned not, and we're going to see a Clint and an Exborg pick. We saw how dangerous Clint was. He did a lot of damage. He has a lot of poke potential in the early to mid game. And in the late game, he had a lot of burst damage. But we've seen Exborg actually getting banned today. And maybe that's saying something that, hey, Exborg is very popular here. He's very strong. Don't let him in the hands of the wrong player. He might do well or he might do bad. Who knows? But that's left to see. And right now, I think they're probably going to target a roamer or a jungler ban. And we're going to see the walking refrigerator getting banned, as we like to call him. And let's wait for the last ban of Team Nigeria until we're going to uh, probably get another jungler or mid lane ban. But I think it's going to be a jungler. They're focusing way more towards that. There's, there's the Marty's, the French Rain ban, and probably oh, an E ban, which is interesting. Yeah. They're probably yeah, so maybe Alice mid lane. It's an Alice XP lane, not an Alice mid lane, but that's interesting drafting. And I'm sorry for interrupting you, Deku. No, you're fine. I was thinking the same thing. It is interesting uh, because Yumi has been playing the mid lane for them. So if they keep it in Yumi's hand, that does mean that they were able to waste out two bans then uh, from Nigeria here who have banned the Valentina and Eve. So it, it would really be hilarious if Yumi keeps this, this Alice. Um, and I think they are because they banned out an, a mage. So they're helping <laughs> Nigeria dwindle their own pool. I think Yumi is going to end up keeping this. I, I think we may have seen them play some draft games and it play, paid off for them. I think so as well, but we're going to use that Xavier ban. Xavier is a very brutal mage in the late game. There is no other mage besides, I think, the second that can challenge him in his range department. He has CC, he has slow, he has a lot of poke, but more, he has a global ult. And we're going to see an Akai. I think for the second time in this entire qualification, which is interesting because mm -hmm. Akai is a strong CC hero. And they have Diggy as well, which will help him not get CC so much. And then they're going to help in team fights a lot. But right now, we're just waiting for the XP laner and the mid lane getting picked, I believe. Or the fighter. No. Oh, that's interesting. It's going to be a switch of roles. Yumi is going the XP lane, or, and Beerus is probably going the mid lane. Or that's maybe a trick playing on us, and they're going to switch, but who knows? Well, we saw this earlier, right? They played this uh, Zast in the mid lane when we thought maybe it got auto locked, but they played this uh, when Mikasa had the Fanny as well in that match. And oh, look, the first alpha that we're seeing in the Africa Regional Qualifiers. It's so, so good to see alpha get picked up here. I don't know how he's going to fare, though, against this team. It's going to be really hard to make it pay off. Back to that Akai point that you made. The Akai, uh, this, is, uh, this is where I feel like the Hanabi is starting. The stock value is starting to rise. They already don't have a lot of dive for the Hanabi outside of Yumi. Um, but the Soul Engager, which is the Minotaur, is not going to be able to set. You have to worry about Diggy with the time journey. You have to think about the Ninjutsu Equinox on Hanabi, the passive on that first skill, able to immune CC with any shield present. And then you have to worry about Akai with that heavy spin rolling you out of the way. That It's a lot of layers to this pocket composition that they have to give uh, Charisma here a good shot to perform on the Hanabi. And there's going to be a, another Kadita. Kadita is a brutal, brutal mage. She can basically wash at most heroes she can go for the Alpha, she can go for the uh, Clean, and she can go for the Zask as well. Her CC plus Petrify combo is very strong in the early game, combining her ultimate. And in objective, she does fairly well, as we saw in the last couple of games. She has done really well, and honestly, I think it's a great pick for them as well, because now Akai can play kind of like double agent here. He can live like a double life. He can either help with the additional peeling for Hanabi, or now they can be more of a threat. You can send Akai to go look for some engages with that headbutt, with the heavy spin, pair it up with the rough ways from Vern's on this Kadita, and you got yourself a single target pickoff right there on any given member from the opposing side. Uh, so it, it's it's like a two-way street here. They can play it either way. They can play it defensively or offensively, just depending on how they feel here. That's, that's actually very, very correct. But something interesting I've noticed is Alpha is using the Festival of Blood which I usually see him paired up with a jungle emblem, with a demon slayer emblem, so he gets a bit more faster clear, he can build a bit more bulkier, he can be a bit more dangerous in the early game. 
but that's not the case here. He's going with Festival of Blood. I think he's going for a bit more of a lifesteal build than jungle clearing. Still, even so, without the jungle, I mean, his jungle here is still pretty slow. Sure, you're talking about life stealing, but let's talk about giving life to all the viewers here. We got Series 3 Game 1 in between Ivory Coast, the 3 P team up against Nigeria. And Zakoda, I feel like we're in for a special one here. Of course. Right now, the games are very positive against Italy. It's just a bit of poke, nothing of the sort. But right now, we can see a bit of a bit Ooh. of Ita. That was very, very nice, actually. You right like now, a bit of an envy early. onto the jungle. Mikey looking to contest on the orange buff. He's going to be able to pick it up, too. He's going to win the first retry battle there. So Nigeria already putting pressure on the board, finding a kill and invading on the jungles. First, we saw Clint try to rotate there to help with the uh, blue, uh, red buff, but there is, was no luck. And against that, the Kalita is recalling back to base to get ready for the third, and maybe even go clear top wave, XP wave, to get that level 4 advantage earlier. Okay, but, definitely could look for some advantage. But as of right now, against that, the Alice is just benefiting a lot from those four minions in the mid lane, getting a lot of stacks on her passive just helping rotating around the map, getting as much uh, um, as many kills as she can for her passive to further her strength up, but the x board I think is going to be a big problem for the side of Ivory Coast. Uh-oh. Big play is coming on right now. They have support. Stephra st stunned here. Rockstar, he's going to pick up the kill. That's going to be a number advantage for them on this first objective for the side of Nigeria. I probably don't think that Turtle is going to be so contested. It would be a bit better to go and contest the bot lane, but you can start the x is filing under tower hard to that Alice. And he's just going to back off play passively. His shield is going to be up soon. But what would be profitable now is to get a Hanabi for the second that Hanabi gets her, gets her two items, two, three items. She's going to be able to melt the entire team of Ivory Coast. Ooh, huge rough waves, not able to find the kill. Forces out the Dominator's Descent, though, from Beerus. And you gotta hate that, man. That Nightmare spawn comes in to save him so much. That's why much play. Sask is underappreciated. He has a lot of survivability with that uh, Dominator's Descent. But it's actually a bit of a waste, but not really. If he had Flicker instead of uh, Inspire, I think it would have been more worth than to use the Nightmare spawn to get that ultimate in, to get it on cooldown, but you can see that it's just slow. The dig is just poking out as much as it can. They're poking that tower shield. They're getting a bit more gold in. They're already at uh, almost 2,000 gold lead, if I'm not mistaken. And it's just playing simple. The Hanabi is getting fed by her own standards. The Clint is not uh, freezing wave, but you can see that they're gathering the meat for a fight. Yeah, we could potentially maybe see something break out here, though, but... The turtle is going to be spawning in in under a minute, so I feel like both teams should play it a little slow here. Kind of just wait until those timers, unless a, a free kill does come underway. But I think they're just going to keep it cool, calm, and collected. Unless, hang on, you be caught by the head headbutt, but the heavy spin isn't going to be able to hold him down. It's able to blink out. So that's going to be a huge ult for him. But in the bot side of the map, Vern's was able to take down Vincizo there. So that's a huge kill. The third kill unanswered still by Ivory Coast. That's allowing that Hanabi to get fed. She's going to be able to get a lot of tower playing. And as I said, Hanabi had inspired before, but now she switched to Aegis, so she's a big counter that cleans. She can get uh, paralyzed, she can get stunned by him. And it's a very, very good trade off, considering Hanabi has no mobility skills and her CC immunity is basically her only thing that can help her escape any fight. That's right. Speaking of fights, that turtle spawn in, and we could see one, but Yumi's low HP. But look at Beerus. He's in trouble. Calls out the Dominator. Descent again on the rough waves. Huge way to evade the damage. Blue side is able to pick up the turtle. Diggy falls down to Beerus. Action's not over. Keep an eye on Beerus. He's very low. Mikey's going to take him down. Yumi working on x -Borg with the Blood Ode. Able to take down Big Ben, making big plays over the wall with the Spear out from Mikasa Ackerman. Finds one with the Rotary Impact and picks up a double kill on the opposing jungle. And just like that, Zakota Ivory back in the game. Four for four, like a Wendy's meal right now. That closed the entire gold gap completely. Those four kills 
made a huge, huge change towards the economy of this game. Right now, you can see that the mid lane tower is getting pushed. They're not doing what they did in the other games. They're not ignoring the tower when there is a possibility for them to be pushed. But right now, I would focus more on the gold lane. As you can see, Hanabi is getting quiet. Fed Shard has an assist, and the Clint has only one death, but still, that's a lot of gold missed out by the Clint. 200, 300, that's a lot. And it is both marksmen though did pick up their first item, but hang on in the mid side. A little bit of action going on. Kadita trying to find a kill. We did see the Spear of Alpha come out. Time journey goes as well. Heavy spin has one up against the wall. Not able to follow it up. No one from either side is gonna fall just yet. Biggie needs to be careful here. Rockstar's in a little bit of trouble. Using the reverse time on the Alpha head, but comes out. They don't have the heavy spin. There goes the Spear of Alpha able to take down Karizama there and finds a double on Vern's. A two-piece no biscuit there from the Alpha Man. But we can see that in the top lane, there's still a bit of they're just forcing a lot of tower pushing. The Alice is cutting wave showing how strong she is in the mid game. She has a lot of domination from that those stacks that she achieved in the mid lane in the early. That makes a lot of difference. It means that most of the towers are getting pressured by a team of Ivory Ghost. Not like in the other games where they like they didn't push any tower, they didn't touch right now. They're playing aggressively for tower, they're playing for map advantage. They are definitely playing for the advantage and things are going in their favor. Looks like Nigeria still wants to contest. They're gonna be a little too slow. Heavy spin comes out. He's pinning Sefri here, not really gonna be able to capitalize on that. They're gonna walk away empty-handed, too late to the party. Invitation didn't get there fast enough. But right now, even if they tried to contest, I don't think they would have been able to watch because uh, Beerus was there, Vincenzo was there, and Mikasa was there as well with a 4-0-1 KDA. And he's going to build a bit of damage. He's not going for that tanky alpha place that we are used to. Right now we see Ooh, Rockstar getting Rock, punished. Star. Goes out. That's right. This is the time journey. Beerus finds the kill on him. Last Insanity comes out. Going to take down Beerus. Huge kill, but... Now going to be able to slowly retreat, so we got a one-for-one one mid laner for the roam. I think you take that trade if you're Ivory Coast. That's not a bad play there, especially when Diggy can spawn anywhere on the map afterwards. That's correct. But right now, we see every tower is getting pressured. In the bottom lane, there is no contest. But in the top lane, the Alice is poking the x Borg out really hard. But you can see Akai heading to him. Mikey is going to probably pin the Alice down, push her into the tower. Ooh. Will he manage Here to? Here we go. No, the teleport again. And I think believe they what is that? Pop the immortality there on export? Immortality, of course. That was a bad plane from Mikey. But it was a mistake. Everything can happen. Maybe he expected X to back out, but he popped the immortality, costing a bit of gold and a bit of annoyance. But that happens. But you can see Hanabi's wave getting pushed very hard. She's already at the top, but she's rotating towards the fight. She can't do much, she's just clearing, she's farming as much as she can. Getting that gold advantage will help. Because most of the uh, Ivory Coast members are tanky, Alpha is tanky, Beerus is a bit tanky, Yumi is tanky, Seraphio it gets tanky in the late game. Also, Vicenzo will probably get an Athena or something if it's hard on him for Kadita. Right, and a lot relies on Kadita here to be able to set up a lot of these fights. Or with Mikey, Mikey's been having a hard time, but he also has been prioritizing the wrong targets. Right, he's been using it on... Sarah, Seth, uh, Seth here on the Minotaur, he's used it on Yumi when the Blink is currently, you know, being sent out, so it hasn't been able to find anything just yet. But if they're able to make this 1-2 combination work, if they're able to find a number advantage, things get a lot easier for them. It just depends if they're going to be able to execute it or not. We can that the Minotaur is getting pressed or hard by the DK. Hang on. Back. The fight's going on. Yumi's into the back line on two members with a Blood Old time journey. Trying to help them sustain right now. Heavy Spin comes out onto the wall, but Minoan Fury, a good response, a good counter. Now remember the following. You see the Spear of Alpha takes down one. He's looking for two. As Vincizo will take down Rockstar. Going to put an end to his concert and rock his world instead. Vern's in trouble. Might be the next one to fall. Use of the Ocean Oddity. Barely able to sustain with the pass of a Kadita. Heals him at the last second. Vincenzo's looking for the final touches, but another Spear of Alpha goes out there, looking to siege the turret. Last Insanity comes on top of him. Big Ben looking for the big boom. Isn't able to find the kills. There goes the fourth swing for sustain, and Vincenzo will connect. Finds one. Will they pick up the second? Yes, he will. Two kills for the gold laner from Ivory Coast. 
Because they're looking to shut out Nigeria at their own base. Right now, it's a very advantageous spot. Ivory Coast they can push the bottom, they can push the top, they can even opt to go for the Lord. As Alpha just got his retribution back just a mere seconds ago. And I think that's going to be the play, clearing the bottom wave, clearing the top wave, pushing all the way at the same time. But it looks like, no, they're going to ignore that, or he's going to farm a bit more. The gap between the jungler is not that far. Both the junglers are one level different, but still, one level can make a huge, huge difference in a Lord or Lord fight. No, it definitely does, right? Because it affects the retribution threshold, right? If you're up a level, you can retreat a little bit earlier. It's a little hard to take account of, especially depending on what jungler you have. There's variables as your jungler can enhance damage or not and what and different things like that. But in between these two jungles, I think it's even they don't really have any moves to uh, increase, right, to stack on top of the retribution. So having any bit of an advantage is huge right now for the what hang on. Keep an eye on to Verns here on this Kadita. He has a pretty nice positioning. He hasn't been revealed yet. I don't think he's going to be able to make a play, though. No one's really overextending. Ivory Coast should be able to pick this up for free. Ooh, they do. If he went in a bit earlier, when they were getting knocked up, but he probably had no vision. What's interesting? We didn't see any of Varia picks. We see They're going to commit. They're, they're using the heavy spin. They're using it on Steph. And again, he's going to miss the mark with the heavy spin. Now, here comes the Spear of Alpha. Time Journey comes out. He had found three members, not able to find the kill. Look at Burns. Vern's still playing from the flank position. Three members are low. Connects with the Petrify. Rough wave trying to go out. He finds the kill on the Beerus this time. Not able to find the second. And now it's time for the counter engage. They'll take him down. Courtesy of Yumi there. Lord still marching down in the mid side though. But no members push with it. Nigeria should make quick work of it. It was a one for one trade. Mage for mage trade. That was, I would say, an equal trade. But... That would be very, it's very bad for the, uh, the side of Ivory Coast because Zas could end, could, could tank a bit more tower shots if that Lord sort of pushed in. But still, it's a level 1 Lord, it's not a upgrade that was on level 2, he can't charge, he can't do much. He's just there to al allow the minions to push the, tur the turrets more. Which is interesting, but also, I was, as I was saying, oh, uh, there was man. a Novaria no pick, but <laughs> Mikey trying to bring that alpha down is so depressing. Mikey has had a hard time. He has been trying, but he, he's going for the wrong target. He went for the marksman or the mage, probably. It definitely does, but hang on. We might have a potential fight. Seth wants to look for a sec. Gets pulled by the reverse time. Look at Yumi, though, with the blood owed. Beerus is going to connect, find the kill on the big bend. They're making big plays. Seth jumps into the turret, gets caught by the time journey. Is gets punished immediately for it. So one for one roam for XP. They're looking to still push onto the tower. They have Yumi here, they have Beerus, they have Vincizo. Not enough damage, though, to be able to take the kill reverse time. Look at Vern's. Finds one with the Breath of Ocean and steals his breath away with the Rough Waves. Finds the kill onto an incredible target, and that's how you find the mark. Now Mikey looking to capitalize on Beerus. Takes him down with the Ice Retribution. Easy kill for him as Rockstar finds one off scream on Yumi. Four members falling for Ivory Coast. Nigeria looking to turn things around, but look at Mikasa on the Alpha. He's going to use the Spear of Alpha to go over the wall and disengage. Can't find the 3v1. Right, as I was saying, um, two fights broke out when I was saying this. You know, Varia would have been a great pick for the side of Nigeria instead of the Diggy, maybe. A lot of vision coming, and we saw the combo with Halita roaming and Novaria in the mid lane. It would have been mm. dangerous. There was going to be a lot of poke potential, a lot of lore revealing. A lot of uh, plays for Karita actually. Uh, revealing that, just giving Karita that one advantage of vision is uh, so important in this game. One mistake and you're done, but if you have an Ovari, you can sense out that mistake and see if there's someone in the bush, if there's someone doing the Lord objective, invading the blue, camping the blue. There is that variable always. Okay. Right now, I think we could potentially see a war break out. Seth is overextending a bit, gets pulled by the reverse time, needs to be careful. Less than half HP, but he does have an immortality. Nigeria finds a tower in the mid lane. Both teams are looking to pull the aggro of this Luminous Lord. 15 minute mark creeping up. Waves neutral. This is a fair fight for either side. Heavy spin from Mikey. What was the play there? Hang on, Burns finds one with the Petrify, but gets re-engaged with the Spear of Alpha. Vin's gonna pop him, take him down. 4v5 now. Time Journey gets forced out. Yumi. Over the wall with the flow of blood. They're trying to take down Big Ben. Seth 
catches him with the knock up pop up, forcing the flicker, and just like that, Ivory Coast is in control for this Luminous Lord. I was a very, very bad engage from Mikey. I don't know who was trying to go for for Alice. Mikey doesn't find it. Now he's stuck in between a rock and a hard place, getting bursted down. He's gonna fall to Vin, but they might be able to take out Mikasa. Do find the kill courtesy of Charisma, but gold laner for Ivory Coast picks up a double kill, flickers in. He's smelling blood in the water, wants to triple. Finds it, picks up the triple kill. Will he find the Maniac? Big Ben spawns back in with the figure of armor, gets popped, and here it goes. The four-piece McNugget. A little bit of sauce from the gold laner from Ivory Coast as he's looking to close out the game here. They have the Luminous Lord marching down. Yumi's leading the way with that charge. Here it goes. The charge passes from Lord. Tower will fall. Now they're looking for the final march on the crystal base. Rough Waves gets forced out, but he doesn't find a target. But they have found the base. He's going to fall potentially. No. Ocean Oddity's out. Many Waves have spawned in. Diggy finds a kill from beyond the grave. We're seeing Isles trying to clear out these waves. Minion are pushing. The towers won. Finally, Ivory Coast yes. will end that game. And what a match, Zakoda. That was a very intense match. A bit, some questionable bits, but that's to be expected. Mikey was maybe not in his best element. Maybe he was a bit overwhelmed. But that takes into consideration you're, you're supposed to time out. You're not supposed to go for a roam or you're not supposed to go for a very agile uh, XP laner like Alice. Uh, Alice is very agile with her teleportation. She, she should have went for a clean, maybe for the Zaz clean against the wall, giving him a free kill. An advantage would help a lot. Akai having that purifier ultimate would make him very, very intense to get that lower, to get any objective. That's why I think he was a good pick here, but he has played extremely wrong. Maybe if he was in the roaming position, it would be a bit better. Potentially. And, but again, Ivory Coast, though, showing up in Series 3 after a rocky Series 2 where they got swept. They opened up this match with a bang. Pulling out the Beerus, the Zask, and the Yumi Alice once again. The tried and true combination sees them through to a first game victory in the third series of today. But here are the stats. Here's Dakota. Break these down for me. Right now, you can see that the Alpha was building tankiness, but he was also building a bit damage. Brute Force giving that a bit of movement speed to run away from that Akai, to run away from the Hanabi, even from that Kadita. You can see that the Kadita was on the roaming position as well. She bought Rome later in the game. She was a bit under farm. The Diggy had a bit more gold advantage. And most roamers nowadays. Actually, most mid laners or people are under the roamers by roaming boots so they don't drag the team back. The stats, the roaming that the gold gets is based on the most gold in the team, which is interesting. But you can see that Vicenzo had a very, very good KDA 8 2 3 as a mark, as a clean. That's very interesting. And he was building that uh, uh, immortality earlier in the game to counter that character to end that base. And Zas was just doing a lot of damage, a lot of attacks with, uh, with that Inspire. He was melting the, the tanks of the team of Nigeria. Even so, that Hanabi pick was very interesting. And now we're going to watch the replays. You can see all the action going on right from the start. It seemed like Ivory Coast was in trouble. They met a bit of aggression that they never met before. But right here is where things turned around for them. They lost one member, but they found a turtle and then they found four kills to add on top of it. This is the moment the game turned around here, Zakoda. The moment the four for four happened, they got in their bag. Did not let the pressure up at any point after that. Going for trades, going for engagements, able to find the plays. I mean, look at this. And shout out to Mikey. For a bit of that game, it looked like he was playing for Ivory Coast to help him out the way those heavy spins were missing the mark definitely played a part in giving Ivory Coast the opportunity to get back in that match. Yumi came up huge on the Alice as well. It felt like the whole team was just so coordinated, Zakoda. They they played three games, I think four actually. And they played them extremely well, like they played them over and over and over. They had the warming up, they knew what they were up against. They dealt with this player before probably, as they're from the same region, but it shows the drafting potential of a coach. And without the coach, it was a bit questionable that Hanabi, if there was a better marksman, maybe a Borod, something that could punish that uh, Zask, or even that uh, Alpha, it would have been a bit more interesting. They wouldn't have been expecting a, a Alice in the XP lane. Probably they were expecting in the mid lane, as I stated before. 
but it's interesting that Yumi and Beerus switched roles. As we saw in the first two games, Beerus was usually on the XP lane playing out and Yumi was in the mid lane playing mages. You know, watching that match, seeing some of the matches from Series 1, unfortunately didn't really happen in Series 2 as we transition into the draft, kind of all almost through the first phase here for bands. Uh, the side of... of uh, I've been just having a mind blank right here on the name Ivory Coast. I, I feel like they should get the name like the Comeback Kids, right? Because they played a couple games now where they were behind and still were able to overcome and ultimately find victories in the Africa Regional Qualifiers. I might hold off maybe for this match. Let's see maybe if it happens again, they fall behind. But they that last match was really good. I mean, they were down early 4-0. to zero. They got invaded, successfully invaded by the opposition. Nigeria pulled off a great play there. And then one turtle fight, a four man wipeout, picked up the turtle, only lost one member, and they time never let it go from there. No they just played it like it was on their life, it depended on their life. And we're going to see the bad tricks on the first lot first week, and we're going to see the Alice probably getting picked again in the XP lane. We saw how annoying she is to deal with in the XP lane. And even so, she was going for the backline, not letting them come for her. They were just zoning out everyone. And probably we're going to see a Minotaur from Sephirin again. Still on the table, there is the... Uh, not Arlo was banned, my mistake. The joy we haven't seen. Melissa was banned. One man still up for grabs. Uh, glue still. Maybe good, but we didn't see a Balmon. We saw an Alpha, but we didn't see a Balmon. We saw how great Alpha did against the tanky team. And we're going to see a Yu Zhong is is very interesting paired up versus the Alice. She has a lot of life still, she has a lot of life still, but Yu Zhong has way better team fight engagement. He can go cancel Alice, he can go for the backline, he can go for the marksman, he can just destroy everyone having that CC immunity on his dragon form. I didn't cure the pain. That's right, and this is gonna be one of the first times that I've seen a, a familiar draft. Beatrix, Valentina, Yu Zhong, this is very standard, this is very normal. Uh, in in a region that we haven't seen a lot of normal. It's been a lot of innovative drafts, very creative approaches to the draft games. But this is a little more standard coming out from the side of Nigeria here, which is which is, could be a good thing. Uh, like I said earlier, the creative drafts, the innovative drafts, they're fun, they're funky, they're cool, but it's a little harder to make them work. That's There's a reason why there's things that are meta, right? It's easy. It's simple and it's effective. Sure, it can get a little boring. Sure, it can get a little worn out, but it's tried and true. It's very reliable. The picks and the win conditions aren't messy. You know exactly what to do to find the win con. Uh, but a team like Ivory Coast, though, that's why I have to give them so much praise and kudos. They've been pulling out these unconventional picks all day. They have not swapped. They will not submit to the meta. They don't care about patch notes. They just want to play what they want to play. They play at their own pace. They play to their own strengths. And it's been paying off for them huge in the Africa regional qualifiers. That's correct. But we're going to see, as I said, another unconventional pick, the clean. He pairs, I would say, pretty well versus Bellatrix, but Bellatrix can outrange it with Renner. She gets the Nibiru passion that ultimate. She can clear wave. She can rotate a bit better than Clint to team fights. But in the early game, I think Clint takes the cake, takes the cupcake off the table in front of Beatrix. But also, we have seen the mages getting banned from the team Nigeria. We see that Eve getting banned. Also, we seeing two assassins, Fanny, Ling, and actually three assassins and Arlo getting banned. And we're going to see an Arlo ban. But still, the Valentina can copy the alt of Minotaur, can copy the blood oath of Alice. Even so, they can maybe even copy the ultimate of Clint, that uh, grenade bullet. It's going to be an interesting, interesting draft going towards the side of Nigeria. And I mean, now starting to wrap up, right? The second phase of bands. We're going to be getting to the picks. I'm honestly really excited to see what Ivory Coast would pull out. They could look to pull out the Zask again. They did win with it. Uh, normally, you know, the, the saying goes, if you, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Right. And it's won them two of two of the matches. Both of the times they pulled it out has resulted in a victory. I wouldn't be surprised if they lock it in again. They already locked in three of the last picks from last game with the same composition. They can do it right now. Oh, and they bait out this ass. They're not going to let them do it. <laughs> They're not going to let them repeat. The Zask was very annoying. He always escaped. Are we going to see a Khalid again? From Beerus again. 
it's going to be at Alice mid lane, presumably. That's actually interesting. As I said before in the last game, Alice can go in the mid lane, jungle, and XP lane department. She's another rounder like Joy. Joy can go in the mid lane, can go in the jungle, can go in the XP. Even so, maybe a Julian would work great for the side of Nigeria. He has a lot of CC out of mobility, but even so, they're going for that Grok, for that big stun, for that big AoE stun, for that CC immunity against that Minotaur, even so against that Khalid. And the Khalid with the Execute again, still, like I said, staying to their own unique play style. They literally will not submit to the meta. They are going to keep playing what they want to. And honestly, I'm a fan of it. I love seeing these type of teams, man. They keep the matches so interesting. But enough on them. Nigeria, again, has a very traditional draft. Minus the X-Borg. X-Borg's uh, different, a little more unique. It's not something that gets picked up a lot. It did get picked up in last game. Um, but that's only the second time we've seen it out here in the Africa Regional Qualifiers. This is my first time seeing it in the competitive season uh, at all in any of the regions so far this year. Uh, but for the rest of it, though, everything's pretty spot on. It's a very spotless draft, very clean, very tidy, very neat. I pretty much know what to expect from this composition. It just comes down to their execution. Now, that Harith, that oh. is a very interesting pick to lock into their jungle. Earlier today, we actually did talk about Torrid, but not in the jungle, in the mid lane. I mean, the in the golden, my mistake. Two unconventional picks in the jungle. I mean, we saw Harith before in jungle, but right now, I don't think he's that great. Even so, Exborg with his last Incinity, he has that uh, crowd control, and he the slow everything, he has that crowd control, I mean, he has a lot of potential in the jungle versus the team that they have. He can immune Minotaur, he can immune card. even so, he can go face to face with Yumi, with Alice. Yeah, this is, oh, man, it's really tough, because now I'm wondering, how do you even answer up against the Herith? What exactly do you have besides, like, uh, Grog here? I mean, maybe Mikey can play this exploit, right? If you pull out the last Insanity on top of the Zalman Force, the AoE should cover pretty much all of that. And you just force Ackerman to sit in inside of that last Insanity. Welcome could be something to pay off for them. But speaking of sit in, we're moving in to the second game of the third series in between Ivory Coast and Nigeria here. Ivory Coast currently holding the lead back in the spot we'd normally see them looking maybe to complete another sweep the third sweep of today and would be what the sixth sweep of the africa regional qualifiers yeah that's be correct sixth sweep but something that would pair up with the last insanity that you said would be you john going with that third skill with that knock up and with that petrify allowing expert with that last insanity to get a bit more damage in to get a bit more stacks in allowing him to get a bit more true damage Right, and that's the thing they do have. They do have a bit of the true damage with Mikey, right, on this X board. So that's one way to kind of deal not only with Mixa but also to the rest of the composition, right? Uh, Seth on this Minotaur, the Alice as well. I am interested though on how they'll be able to burst that down. Uh, Beatrix isn't really the greatest marksman into into Alice, especially in Alice with Vengeance. The SMG Nibiru is going to be really hard to pull off any consistent DPS with Alice using flow of blood on top of you sitting on top of you with the blood ode with vengeance popped it's gonna be very hard to capitalize on but look at that an invade from nigeria but this time they aren't able to successfully complete an invade ivory coast will pick it up but, oh hang on rockstar he's gonna be forced to flicker almost gets punished for trying to provide vision overstepping his boundaries ivory coast will not let him stay for long something interesting that be actually Worth to talk about is Khalid's emblem. It's not Festival of Blood. It's the emblem when you slow down enemies, you do a bit more damage Ooh. towards them. And there's going to be a pick up on Beerus as we talk about them. I talked bad and look what happened. Not just a pick off, it's not just anyone. That's a first blood. So huge gold spike over to the side of Nigeria. Turtle up. Mikey needs to pick up some of the shields. He needs to get his figure of armor back. It's very hard to secure. An objective without it, but it looks like Mikasa isn't going to go for it. He needs to pick up his purple buff. Mikey should be done with it. And the rest of the team is zoning out for the members of Nigeria. Good zoning from them. No one even gets close to this pit. They lock it in. But it looks like maybe they want to advance. Seth's a little low. Big Ben into the tower. 
I may have made a mistake. Use the black dragon though. Last insanity from Mikey. Forces the flicker out. Doesn't find the kill. Alice gets stunned with the wild charge. Pop the vengeance. Mikey's all alone. Gets cornered off and gets sent home up to get sent up to the caster's desk with us. I'll be very interesting to hear him what he has to say about that one play. But still, a mistake can happen. It's a one-to-one -one score. Right now, Nigeria is sitting by about 600 gold or so. Not a big, big lead, but it's still a lead that can change the game. All right now, if they had maybe a Minsita instead of that Exborg in the jungle, that, uh, that Beatrice would be a bit more self-sufficient. She could have got that Bear's Rage, that big AoE ulting, allowing them to get a lot of damage on one or more targets. Ooh, hang on. Big engagement up in the top side. Need to see the Nibiru come out. Harith is focusing down on the Charisma here. Nibiru's Passion comes out, but it's a bad time to pull it. Gets dropped to less than half HP. Mikey late to the party. Still looking to crash it, though. Ivory Coast wisely is going to go look to back off, but hang on. Mikey catches Vin, blocks him. But the flicker comes out at the right moment. Last Insanity won't find the kill. We've seen Garok use his ultimate actually very early on in the fight when you expect him to use it when there's a bit more key members from Ivory Coast around a rock or a wall or any of his deployable ones, actually. But the games are passive right now. You see that Khalid with his movement speed from his passive. You see the Garouk just going around walls, getting a bit of more movement in, rotating towards that mid-fight, towards that blue fight, maybe trying to pressure him into using Retribution, pressuring Mikasa into using Retribution. But right now, there is just nothing that they can do. Decide, play it safe, Go in, try to get a good engage on the turtle. Right now, there is a three versus three in the top lane, and the Clint is on his way as well. That's right. And right now, they have a little bit of control of Rockstar. Looking to be there with the wild charge. He can deny the retribution. Misses the mark. It's up for anybody, but Rockstar will find it. He's able to pick this up. Huge man on Fury. Will they be able to capitalize? Mikasa's over the wall, looking to count onto Charisma. Hasn't been able to find the kill. Vern's in a bit of trouble. Yumi over the wall. Flicker forced out on Vern's. Able to survive a little bit longer. Two kills unanswered and a turtle that did fall into the hands of Rockstar. Beerus will connect to Mikey. Puts him in the sand coffin. Vern's gets tower dive. Ivory Coast is committing to induce massive pain to Nigeria. They said you took our turtle and now we have to take your lives in response. We saw, we saw Grop redeem himself by use, getting that turtle objective. Still, the lead is not that far away from Nigeria. 800 gold and they could get back. I'm going to find a kill in the bot lane by Big Ben on our boy Mikasa. He was showing us his retribution skills lately, but that one was a bit off. And there is going to be two turrets for the side of Ivory Coast. As I said, they're not letting any turrets down. Right now, they're just getting as many as they can. They're playing for turrets. They're playing for objectives as much as they can. In the games that we saw previously, they're just ignoring them. They're just going for team fights for. <laughs> You're talking about ignoring, and that's exactly what Big Ben just did as he took that tower. Did not care at all that Sarah was breathing down his neck. Easy pickup for him, but look at Sarah looking for the wraparound. Doesn't know that Rockstar and Verns are close. Needs to be careful. You also see Mikey making his rotation down. There's a 4v2 if they break out this fight. They call out the conceal. Mikey's going to commit. Yumi's on his way as well. Doesn't commit to the blood flow. Is wise not to teleport into that unchecked bush. Our lanes are almost pushed by the team of Ivory Coast. Beside the bot lane where Big Ben is residing. He's trying to go out with a big boom before that. Even a big bang, you could say. Maybe he's <laughs> trying to go for a sneaky fight with the Black Dragon. Maybe he has the concealed a bit early. He used it to get his passive up on the Golden Crab. But he's probably going to charge in for an objective. No fear at all. As he's a usual to get that sustained ability. Here we go. Last Sandy that comes out is going to be able to pick it up. Mix Ackerman will find the Turtle. Beerus will take down Rockstar. And nice Man on Fury down on the bot side. Beatrix will find the kill. And then Mikasa Ackerman finds a double kill. Vin will find one as well. Both gold laners are taking lives, taking souls. Two for two, Turtle though did fall into the hands of Ivory Coast, so good trade for them. All right, that's great. In the bottom, maybe there's going to be some pu tower pushing by the Alice. I highly doubt so. She has very low tower pushing potential. Even so, she has a, a lot of range. 
Maybe if the clean switch lanes with Alice went back to the bot lane, pushed a lot more there, but that doesn't look like it. Look at all. You know, something interesting here I've been looking at for a little bit. Beatrix Charisma went for the Haas Claw first item. Before a Fury Hammer, before a Blade of Despair, even a Malefic Roar, Haas Claw first item. Very unusual. Not typical at all, but nothing has been typical about Nigeria. Even from that, Valentina going for that kind of new build for, uh, for taking that Necklace of Durance first item. This is a very interesting team. Nigeria is a is a team full of tricks, man. They play similar, but I can see why Belcher's got that Haas Claw first item, getting a lot more sustainability on when fighting the Alice will help a lot because oh. the Jong is in a one versus four station really able to get out. I mean you could say Nearly. he got out on a on a left leg but able again. to uh escape there. Again something just they're copying the out of Khalid, not of Minotaur. That's something mm. that I would not expect to see. Maybe to try to go in with that more connect out uh -oh. a bit more space in a Ackerman it's taken down. Mikey picks up the kill on him. Now they're rotating over. Will they be able to catch Yumi and Vin? Vin could be in trouble. He's able to satchel him way out of there. Yumi looking to find a kill onto Charisma, but he misses the blood flow. Misses the mark completely. Pops back out the blood ode. Both of these teams barely missing the marksman, but Beerus finds Mikey in the mid-river bush. The junglers died the most in this game on both teams. Not the fighters that do the time, not the roamers, the junglers died the most times in this game. You can see Bidius is just zoning out that bad chicks, probably getting a kill on her as well. Ooh, and they do find one on Turkarisma. That's a huge kill. Raging Sandstorm over onto Beerus. Will he be able to find the kill? Jesse at Yumi finds Verns. Rockstar is able to find a kill. That's a shutdown into the roamer's hand. Meanwhile, Mikasa was able to pick up that Lord. Nigeria right now is currently stumbling Zakota. They're falling behind the mark. They fell a lot in gold and in towers right now. The team Ivory Coast is not letting them push any towers, not letting them get close. They're not letting them do the same mistake they did in bot lane. That, that first Lord is going to be the biggest thing, biggest threat towards the team of Nigeria. Just those minions will be able to push their way into the enemy base super easily if they're left unattended. Still, the, the level gap and the goal gap is not so different because that actually Mikey is almost one level actually they're now same level but he was one level higher than Mikasa which is interesting but the goal lead is only 2k or so difference but that can be easily turned around in a good team fight we can see that almost all of the members are getting the core items Xbor getting his Big Ben Found the kill right now, Sarah all alone, using that Manor and Fury, trying to set up a play. Mikasa Ackerman will find Big Ben, takes down Mikey. Mikey, though, takes one with him on his way out. Vin will pick up a kill. One more into the hands of Mikasa. That's a three-piece. And right now, Ivory Coast can look to close this out. They can find the sweep, potentially. It's just Rockstar all alone. Lord's still up. Mikasa's very low. Pops the Zom in force. But they're going to be able to close this out. Ivory Coast will not be denied. Another sweep in the Africa Regional Qualifiers, our seventh one, Zakoda. That was a very intense game. I actually thought Nigeria would actually beat them in the first game, but two time uh, Team Ivory Coast just turned around every team fight in their perspective. They they made everything work. They pushed turrets. They didn't let Team Nigeria touch their turret, which is interesting. In neither of the games, they tried as hard as they can to not let them push any turret. That's what made them lose some of their games that they played recently. Just their adaptation to tower defending. Even so, you would lose an objective at Turtle, but I wouldn't lose a tower. A Turtle you can farm back to, but a turret you can't get back. That's the most heartbreaking thing of this game. If you can't get an objective, at least try to secure a turret. Even so, maybe two, three kills. That would make it worth your while. But I hope we can see soon the leaderboard, if that's possible. Can't wait to see how the scores look there. We can see that Big Ben was going for that default Jujang pillow that Hunter Strike that's been really popular and with the recently buffed anti curious we can see Mikey going for that War Axe, Bloodlust Axe and Valentina going for the life, uh, life anti-heal actually. First item, not the Roamer. The Roamer was going for the second because Alice was hurting so bad in general. 
was going for until second item Khalid going for penetration fully and Clean was going for critical and true damage also our man Mikasa the meet the man the legend was going for a lot of cooldown injection for a lot of attacks for a lot of true damage and it would be great if you could see the replay soon I want to see the best highlights of the game because that's the most intense part after a game seeing the highlights seeing the best things that came after every game seeing the best play maybe even we the caster missed something when we're casting that's possible as we missed the top lane the uh, rock using the alt a bit too early but that can choose to trade indefinitely <laughs> yeah, that's right it would be interesting to see kind of how that looks uh over when those come through but again man just a harp on ivory coast found two sweeps with these picks but here we go let's go ahead and take a look at some of these hot action that was in this match you're seeing it start off again in a way that didn't look good right for ivory coast but then right after this turtle fight they lost this turtle but then they ended up almost completely wiping out the side of nigeria and this is just those comeback plays that comeback potential that ivory coast has man they can lose the objective and still take you down out in the fight they were able to keep themselves cool calm and collected through every stage of this match with these unconventional picks man it's hard to beat a team like this that's confident in their own unique play style you don't know what to expect look at the tower diving they eat just the right amount of tower aggro all of them know their limits they know when to get in they know when to get out i just feel like nigeria was not prepared to deal with the monsters of ivory coast i don't think they're prepared but still that alice thing they're role switching the alice the mid lane the beers in the XP lane probably they're waiting for Alice to be in the XP alone and there's probably another mage for Valentina to take from a Farsa something with a big artillery out but that wasn't the case as they banned out the Eve and look at this man huge play from Mikasa Ackerman and then again they found the neutral but they were also able to find some kills Nigeria had some good potential here in that play Charisma was able to find a double kill but I think those were his last two in that match as you saw Beerus was able to connect to him and the next team fight, the next engagement was quickly popped out. There we saw Burns fall down as well. The Lord completely uncontested. Ivory Coast did such a great job of zoning off for that Lord. And then here, obviously the final push, the final play, Mikasa was able to find a triple kill on this team fight here to go ahead and close out this series. Rockstar was left all alone literally stuck in between a rock and a hard place and the most purest of sense finding the wipeout on four members slowly walking it down took them a little bit of time to go ahead and end it but able to eventually close out the series able to find a sweep our seventh one in the africa regional qualifiers for iesf in Dakota. it was another amazing day all the games there were sweeps which is incredible none of the games went into uh, one one at one, two to one maybe, but all of them went to clean sweeps, zero two. None of the teams had the two one or one one. None of that. All of that the games were clean sweeps, and that was incredible. That was unexpected. I would expect like, some of the games to go a bit into more late late game, maybe 30, 40 minutes. That would be great to see. But the first game of the series, I think, was the longest game. It's so 27 minutes or so, if I'm not mistaken. That's right. 27 minute we, game we saw a lot of action back we saw so many draft picks that were incredible even so we saw that alpha that alpha destruction was incredible i was hoping to see a balmon so that but that maybe to maybe tomorrow actually we're going to see a balmon but that's left to be seen right we could potentially you never know what's coming but here we're gonna look real quick at the group results so far and here they are on the screen for you. We've got Senegal leading in first place up on Ivory Coast. Ivory Coast has been put through the ringer, man. They actually only lost to the number one team, which was Senegal. When they took their sweep, the other two teams they were able to take down. Senegal, though, will be the qualifying team out of today's group. It was a blood fest, man. Really back and forth. True nail biters, Dakota. What are your thoughts on Senegal being able to edge out on top, though? How was expecting to attempt to be at a draw Ivory Coast and Senegal because both of the teams were incredible but the micro and the macro from Team Senegal was on a different level compared to the one on Ivory Coast we, get, we saw them hone their skill a bit later in the evening later in the day actually and that just changed their playstyle completely 
they didn't go for those risky plays. They actually focused more on getting turrets than getting objectives or kills, actually. They were opting out of team fights to get turrets or any other thing that would bring them to an advantage over their team that they're facing. We saw first team Nigeria, they went to get more turrets than turtles, but they actually still contest the turrets. Even so, it and hurry has a lot of crime ability, has a lot of push potential, has a lot of magic damage penetration, has a lot of true magic damage. And right now, the teams are actually looking nice. Senegal deserves that first place. Ivory deserves that second place. There's no better team here. Nigeria getting the third place is worth it. And Ghana getting last place is a bit unfortunate, but that just shows the difference between players. That's right. And right here on the screen, we got the qualified teams from Northern Africa, from Western Africa, Egypt, in case you forgot, from day one, put on an amazing performance, sweeping all teams to secure their spot out of the Northern African pool. Today, from Western Africa, we saw Senegal put in work, man, even up against Ivory Coast. Personally, one of my favorite teams, Senegal even made them look like a quick meal on their trip out to IESF to confirm for Western Africa. All we got left ladies and gentlemen is southern africa in the regional qualifiers for this amazing beautiful hidden gem of a region of mlbb and tomorrow we're going to find out the answer who is going to be the winner of the last game but dude i'm we're gonna keep this game secret till tomorrow we're gonna have to wait for it to find out it's going to be intense it's going to be a one game best out of three but it's going to be probably the most intense game of the series but I just got word and probably it's going to be a best of five, not a best of three, my mistake. It's going to be only one game, but let's hope to keep it as far back as we can. Let's see what these teams are made of. But I don't have any other words for today. Do you have any, Deku, perhaps? Uh, man, I'm almost left speechless, man. Today was another day of shock out here in the Africa Regional Qualifiers. It was a monumentous day. I feel like it was better than day one, so that's always good when things are on the up and up. Tomorrow we got that best of five, and I'm really excited about that because I feel like once you go to the best of five, things change a little bit more. Drafting, uh, mistakes can be covered in a longer series. We'll definitely be able to stay up here a little bit longer. Even if it's a sweep, it'll be longer than a best of three sweep because it'll be a best of five. We'll at least get one more game with Coda. So definitely looking forward to that, but an amazing day. Shout out to all the viewers, shout out to the production team, the amazing players we got to commentate again, and a great time casting with you as well, Dakota. I also had a great time seeing these beautiful players and this beautiful production team. There was some mishaps in the first half, but that happens in every production game. There's some mistakes that happen. Of course, they can't be like that, but these is are the qualifiers. The players are somewhat unexperienced with tournaments, pro plays, but starts to be expected of an undiscovered uh, basically continent for MLBB. I've known some of the teams because of some Egyptian players. I'm friends with close uh, team uh, Occupy Thrones. I'm friends with, but still, seeing the Senegalia players is incredible. They are almost on the same level, but still, they showed an incredible lineup, an incredible momento. They just kept winning and winning and winning. They didn't lose anything, but. As I, you said, I'm left forward, I'm speechless. All the teams are incredible. My name is Zakota, and uh, that's all I have to say for today. That's right, and I'm Coach Deku, and we'll catch you all tomorrow, bright and earlier, maybe late for you, bright and early for me, for day three of Africa Regional Qualifiers. Goodbye for now, see you guys tomorrow.